The story of A Plague Tale Requiem is an experience I will never forget. Released on October 18th, 2022, it's one that, over its roughly 20 hour runtime, will reach into your very soul and have you experience some of the most visceral of human emotions. An emotional roller coaster from start to finish, littered with great highs and equally great lows, it takes you down a dark road, where the manner of one's humanity is explored, how it changes and reacts when put under immense, almost inhuman amounts of duress, and how, when it all comes together, one may navigate this dark road to its completion. As mentioned in the last video in this series, the Plague Tale series is a deeply emotional, deeply human set of stories. Yet with Requiem, Sobo took what they did with Innocence and amplified it by a thousand, maybe even a million, with greater stakes and greater turmoil, once again set against the backdrop of one of history's greatest catastrophes. Never before have I had a whole game and its story leave me so emotionally broken, such was the experience. And yet I'm so very glad to have experienced it, and can confidently count Requiem's story among my favorite video game narratives, one that I cannot recommend enough. Again, as mentioned in the last video, I couldn't wait to jump back in and experience it all again. This is in spite of the many nightmare scenarios you, as Amicia, find yourself in. Like everything, the horror of the last game has been amplified significantly here. However, like anything, it's not perfect, and like its predecessor, it suffers from occasional contrivances and stretches of logic, to varying degrees of acceptability. There are also a few very important questions that are asked throughout that are never answered, though this could be to help set up a possible third game, or because the potential answers are too uncomfortable to be brought to light. Such will be the subject matter of this video, where we will analyze Requiem's story from start to finish. As a standard fare on this channel, I will only speak on gameplay when and where it's applicable, appropriate, or unavoidable as it pertains to the story. I would be remiss if I didn't include my obligatory spoiler warning for the entirety of Requiem's story, as well as portions of Innocence. I strongly recommend you watch my previous video on Innocence, or better yet, play both games beforehand. Requiem in particular is best experienced knowing nothing, especially about its big moments, and this video will be waiting for your return. I also feel compelled to add a warning before we kick things off. There will be scenes and images that may make you feel incredibly uncomfortable and distressed. As mentioned in the last video, Innocence does not pull any punches on its grotesqueness, and neither does Requiem. Requiem, however, will also throw in a few kicks to the face for good measure. It does not, in any way, hold back, and thus I feel it prudent and necessary to give this kind of warning in one that isn't just text on a screen. With that said, viewer discretion is strongly advised. Now, without further ado, grab yourself a stiff drink and join me as we continue to follow Amicia and Hugo on their emotional saga through plague-ridden southern France. The story begins rather ominously. After a scenic shot of a castle set against the picturesque southern French countryside, we immediately see Amicia and Hugo on the run from some unknown assailant, which may immediately get your back up. They eventually reach a lone tower, where they turn and face their pursuer, who emerges from the bushes. Ha! Bloody brambles! <laughs> You're going too fast for me! Turns out it was all just a game, and the trio all share a laugh, while we the player can relax if we were indeed fooled by this early ploy. We then follow Hugo down a road towards the ruined castle, where they continue their game at a set of similar ruins found along the way. Six months have passed since the end of Innocence, and the Daroons and Lucas have been on the road, heading for an as of yet unknown location, having been forced to leave Aquitaine behind. If you remember, after they killed Vitalis and severely crippled the Inquisition, powerful people, presumably what is left of the Inquisition, went after them, making them something akin to pariahs in the region. While we don't get too much in the way of specifics of the last six months, what we do know, and is drip-fed over the opening few hours, is that things have been relatively peaceful. The Prima Macula, the corruption in Hugo's blood, has calmed, pretty much to the point of becoming dormant once again, and that Beatrice, Amicia and Hugo's alchemist mother, has taken Lucas on as her apprentice. From these opening minutes, you may quickly notice a couple things that are changed from the first game, most notable among them being that they're all using English accents instead of the quaint, lilty French accents of the previous game. Hugo? I'm really sorry. I need to leave. Don't worry, I'll stay with Lucas. Good. Sorcerer, catch us! <sighs> hey, slow down. You'll exhaust our villain. This is your tower. It's evil. This may be a bit jarring at first, especially if you're jumping into Requiem straight from Innocence, but it's a change that I think works wonders in enhancing the dialogue, as it allows for the actors in Requiem, none of whom I believe are native French speakers, based on my research, to be far more expressive and perhaps organic in their performances. 
At the smaller ruins, the trio continue their game by playing hide and seek, where the game's stealth mechanics are introduced, including how to sneak up behind unsuspecting targets and take them down, though in this instance it's just to give Lucas a good scare. From here, Lucas decides to return to his studying, despite Amici and Hugo's insistence that he stay longer. The siblings in the meantime continue to explore the land surrounding the castle. They eventually reach a small river where they continue their game. It's at this point we're reintroduced to Amicia's sling, which we use to shoot pine cones Hugo sends down the river, masquerading as an evil sorcerer's army. They're eventually joined by a young boy, similar in age to Hugo, named Tonan, who lives nearby and came to investigate after hearing Amicia's sling. Tonan joins in their game, which concludes with him throwing a large boulder into the river before he rather awkwardly states that he needs to return home because he's late for work. The worried look on his face immediately draws Amicia's concern, but he disappears before she can inquire more. Continuing to follow the river, the siblings decide to explore the castle itself, getting in through a narrow opening in one of the towers overlooking the locked main gate. Ascending the tower, they reach the battlements, and it's here that the good times come to a screeching halt when they fall through the floor. Are you hurt? No, but I want to go back now. They both agree that they've had enough for today and look to make their exit, though we can't go back the way we came, even though it looks more than climbable. Instead, we have to go through another door out into the castle's main grounds. Hugo is quick to point out that they've fallen into someone's home, judging by all the usual homely fixings, food, clothes, the like. Strangely, the home is devoid of people, and as they near the way out, they both smell burning. Exiting the house, they find the source of the smell. What? It's all burned. It's recent. Rows of beehives recently burned, the air choked by smoke and ash. The castle is clearly far from being abandoned, and yet there are still no people in sight. That is, until we run into some. Hey! What, what's going on? How many of you are there? Wait! We didn't mean to trespass. We fell here by accident. We'll leave if you show us how. Lies! I swear! I don't know what's happening here, but we have nothing to do with it. Lies! You bloody thieves! I'll cut you to pieces! Run! It's here that we get our first chase sequence, of which there are quite a few in Requiem compared to Innocence. This one's quite short, but it does a good job of reintroducing the player to the concept, as well as being quick with the button prompts. Once we manage to evade the axe-wielding lunatic, we take cover in some tall grass, where we see two more basket heads chase down another man, presumably a resident of the castle who, after being tripped up, promptly gets an axe to the face. A not-so-subtle reminder of the sort of narrative tone that this series has. There isn't much that is directly stated as to what's going on in the castle, but a rough idea can be gleaned based on overheard conversations. In short, the raiders are beekeepers who once lived in the castle, but for whatever reason were forced out by others who promptly took over the beekeeping operation for themselves. Now, the raiders have returned with a vengeance, killing anyone they deem to be a thief. Amici and Hugo have arrived in the midst of this, and despite saying that they just got lost and have nothing to do with the thieves, the raiders see them as such and seek to kill them. This forces us to stealthily get out of the castle, and it's during this segment that the game's stealth mechanics are expanded upon, using distractions, hiding under tables, using Hugo to crawl through small openings to unlock doors, and so on. Along the way, we learn that Tonan is a brother of some of the raiders, and that his job was to watch out for more of the thieves. Instead, he ran off and played with Amici and Hugo, his disappearance getting the leader of the raiders, and one of his brothers, more than a little riled. We find Tonan again just as we're about to make our escape, being choked to death by his brother with another looking on. Hugo intervenes even as he and Amicia are about to get away, and the siblings are confronted by the two older raiders, named Matthias and Remy. Amicia tries to talk their way out of it, even taking the blame for Tonan's lateness, but the raiders won't hear it. A scuffle ensues, leading to Amicia getting choked out, though not before using a knife against Matthias, something she's never done before. Hugo attempts to rescue her, but is pushed away by Remy, who proceeds to help Matthias kill Amicia. Before they can, however, Hugo summons a certain dangerous power, before falling unconscious, and the screen fades to black. When we return, we find ourselves on an island with two large mountains, with a strange bird swooping in from the ocean before perching and looking down on an unconscious Hugo. When he awakens, he's immediately confused about where he is and what the bird's doing. It's then that he suffers from a sudden headache, followed by blackened veins growing all over him, a sign that the macula is returning with a vengeance. It's at this point that the bird begins to lead him along the beach, doing a fancy vanishing act all the while. Scared and with no idea what to do, Hugo begins to follow it. You might have figured out by now that this is a dream, one that, as we'll learn a little later, Hugo's been having for quite some time. The bird in question is a phoenix, 
a mythological creature that, across various centuries and cultures, has come to symbolize immortality, resurrection after death. It also holds great importance in alchemy, representing resurrection and renewal, the final stage of alchemy. Case in point, in Innocence, the box where we find the elixir Beatrice was working on in her secret laboratory bore the symbol of the phoenix on its front. Following the phoenix eventually leads us away from the beach and through a narrow passage in a seawall that eventually leads to a meadow. Across the meadow is a pond with a large tree, with a sort of temple overlooking it, the phoenix watching Hugo from a crumbling pillar. As Hugo approaches the pond, the macula begins to consume him, forcing him to a walk, then to a crawl. The sky and land grows ominously darker, and Hugo begs for it all to stop, while the phoenix looks on in stark silence. He eventually reaches the pond's edge, and miraculously, once his hands touch the water, the blackened veins begin to recede, and the land becomes light once again. Hugo thanks the phoenix for leading him to the pond, and looks to approach it, before the screen fades to black. It's here that Hugo reawakens, finding himself in the back of a cart with Lucas, while Beatrice and Amicia sit up front. Amicia will ask Hugo if he was having his dream again, which he confirms, before asking about what happened back at the castle, to which Amicia lies and said he simply felt very tired and fell asleep. As we pass through a small village, we first learn of the Order of Alchemists, an ancient organization that Beatrice and formerly Laurentius are a part of. The Daroons and Lucas are on the road to a place known only as the Red City, to get Hugo checked out by another Magister of the Order. Though this is the first time the Order has been mentioned in this series, their influence can be felt across innocence. You may recall a particular symbol scattered around certain locations in that game, including the Chateau d'Ambrage. We'll also learn later that it was the Order that kitted out Beatrice's secret lab in the Roman bathhouse. They're presumed to be experts on the Prima Macula, having studied it for centuries. And yet, as Amicia is quick and right to point out, they did nothing to help the Daroons back in Aquitaine when the Inquisition came after them. Beatrice claims that the Order didn't know the Inquisition would come after them, which I find to be rather bullshit. While they weren't above working from the shadows, the Inquisition wasn't exactly subtle at the best of times. The Order was also well aware that Hugo was the carrier well before the events of Innocence. One would think that they'd have kept a closer eye on him and his family, just as the Inquisition did, and thus promptly respond if there was even the slightest hint of danger. Instead, they got caught with their pants down, and left Amicia and Co. to do all the heavy lifting in taking down Vitalis. Only now, with the Inquisition long behind them, is the Order ready to welcome the Daroons, which has ruffled Amicia's feathers more than a little bit, but for now she's willing to play along if it means sitting Hugo on the path to being cured. Just past the village, some peasants have set up a checkpoint, checking all passing travelers. They're in search of a boy and a girl who trespassed on a family's property. An argument followed and some men were slaughtered, as witnessed by the younger brother. Hmm, I wonder who they could be referring to. Beatrice attempts to talk their way out of it, but Hugo is discovered. The peasants grab Amicia before their horse is spooked and pulls the cart away in a panic. So begins our first stealth gauntlet, where everything we learned in the castle is put to the test, with the added caveat that Amicia doesn't have her sling still on the cart, meaning she can't fight back. After a short chase sequence, where the father of the slain men sets a field on fire and Amicia is almost killed, save by falling debris, we find the cart, destroyed and scattered, and her sling, just as another peasant moves in for the kill. It's here that we're taught how to counter, something we really couldn't do in Innocence, save for certain instances, as well as how certain enemies can be choked to death with a sling if they're in a dazed state. This can also be done by sneaking up on enemies. Now that we have the sling, we can properly fight back, though stealth remains very much a viable option if we choose. All the while, Amicia will lament how none of this should have happened, angry with both the peasants for starting it and herself for letting it escalate. We eventually find the others, with Beatrice being held hostage by a peasant. With no other choice, Amicia kills the man, saving her mother, before checking on Hugo who's gone unconscious due to shock. As we can see, she's badly shaken by what's just happened, her hands shaking and her breathing labored and inconsistent. Six months of peace and quiet have just been shattered in the space of presumably a few hours, Amicia once again forced to kill. Beatrice falls to her side and attempts to calm her down, just as Hugo reawakens. The screen fades to black, and we're greeted by the title screen. After an undetermined amount of time, the Daroons and Lucas arrive at the Red City, where they have a house waiting for them, prepared by one Magister Vaudin, another member of the Order and expert on the Macula, where they can reside in peace and quiet. Entering the city, they find that there's a fair going on, celebrating Midsummer and the Feast of St. John the Baptist. With Beatrice's permission, Amicia and Hugo set out to explore the fair, telling her to seek out a house at the top of the hill with a phoenix weather vane when they're done. 
From here, we're afforded some limited exploration, chock full of interactions with the city's denizens. There's even a small throwing game we can do, which introduces us to the collectible souvenirs, which we can find scattered across the game's levels, though they're more like hidden story moments any eagle-eyed player might find throughout the story. There's also some amount of foreshadowing, both from these interactions and from overheard conversations as you explore, about future events. With regards to the Red City itself, though as mentioned earlier it's only ever referred to as such, it's loosely based on the city of Arles in southern France, the two sharing a plethora of similarities. Both cities reside on a river, both have red brick or roof buildings, and have a conspicuous Roman amphitheater. The main difference comes from the surrounding geography. While the land around the Red City is quite hilly, the land around real world Arles is notably flat. Once we're done exploring, we can head up to the house with Lucas waiting for us just outside. After sharing a moment looking out over the city, we head inside where Amicia takes a suddenly tired Hugo upstairs to have a nap. Just as Amicia is about to let him sleep, Hugo will tell her that she must go with him to the island in his dream, so that she might be healed too. What this means is unclear, though if I had to hazard a guess, it could be that Amicia is suffering from some form of PTSD caused by the events of the last game, which, perhaps, hasn't gone unnoticed by Hugo. This appears to be evidenced by when Amicia heads back downstairs, where Beatrice is teaching Lucas. While this is happening, Amicia will stare into a candle and enter some sort of trance, and echoes of memories of the events of Aquatin begin flooding back. She's broken out of this trance when Lucas beckons her upstairs. Something happened to Hugo. A nightmare, caused by the macula, which has been reawakened thanks to the shock of what happened earlier that day. Beatrice instructs Amicia and Lucas to seek out Magister Voldin and bring him back to the house. Before we set off, however, there's something we need to address. A particular plot point that is brought up here. You may remember that there are three thresholds to the Prima Macula's evolution, Hugo passing the first one during Innocence when Lord Nicholas attacked the Chateau d'Ambrage. Beatrice will mention that they had six months of respite after he passed the second threshold, and a big deal is made of the fact that he's reached that second threshold for a good few chapters afterwards, since it's supposedly rare for a carrier to survive that long. However, there's a problem with this. Everyone seems to know when Hugo passed the second threshold, except for us, the player. At no point is it ever revealed when this happened, and we're just sort of left going, huh? When did this happen? There are a few possibilities as to when it occurred. First among them is when they defeated Vitalis, but that could be considered way too soon after the first. Another is that Hugo passed the second when he conjured the rats back at the castle during the prologue, but that mucks with Beatrice's whole six months of respite comment. Some have even suggested this comment is meant to retcon Hugo's passing of the first threshold at the chateau and make it the second, but then the question becomes, then when did he pass the first? It could also very well be just an error in the continuity, one that sticks out like a sore thumb. Whatever the case, something is clearly missing. Context that the characters are well aware of, but the player isn't, which may leave you very confused and borders on being a plot hole, one that thankfully doesn't mess with Requiem, but does mess with the continuity between this game and the last. Amicia and Lucas head back towards the market in search of Odin, a search that leads us to the slums, which seems strange given that the order is far from being poor, though Lucas suggests that Odin may be in hiding. The Roman amphitheater is located in the slums, and it's upon reaching it that we discover an order symbol next to one of its entrances, suggesting that he's in there. Unfortunately, the area is closed on the orders of the Count of Provence, with soldiers strictly enforcing it. We need another way in, and find it through a side door, where we quickly discover the worst possible scenario has happened. The plague, known as the Bite, has reached the Red City. Earlier, you may have overheard a conversation about the amphitheater being locked down due to a large number of animals getting sick and dying, which is believed to be behind the deathly stink emanating from it. The truth, unfortunately, is that the stink is coming from the rotting, diseased corpses of plague victims, locked inside the amphitheater and left to die a slow, agonizing death. Lucas will initially suggest that they brought it with them. Hugo is the carrier of the macula, after all, before suggesting not even a minute later that it could very well have been a sick person that brought it in. In any event, Vodan is somewhere trapped in this mess and they need to find him quickly. Moseying along, we discover that we aren't alone. I don't know him! I swear! You piece of... A band of mercenaries have somehow managed to get inside the arena, and they too are searching for Vodan, considerably raising the stakes. Adding to this increasingly volatile situation is the growing scope of the Bite's mortal grip on the amphitheater and the people that called it home. Dozens of bodies become hundreds, either piled up like refuse or left to die where they lay, whole families succumbing all at once, the plague indiscriminate in its infectious rampage. This is taken to a whole other level when we discover, after traversing the amphitheater's stance, that there's an entire slum within the ruins. The perfect breeding ground for the bite to proliferate, a veritable smorgasbord for the rats. 
At the far end of the amphitheater, across the slum, is a tower bearing the Order's symbol, which Lucas surmises is where Vildan will be. The duo hasten to get there, but an already very precarious situation turns downright dangerously terrible when the rickety walkway they're on collapses, and they fall into the depths of the amphitheater, into a chamber full of eaten corpses. There they find a surviving resident. The man is beyond petrified, at first believing that Amicia and Lucas are with the mercenaries, though those concerns take a major backseat in the worries department when we're greeted by some old friends. Thankfully, the man has a torch and Amici and Lucas are standing in sunlight. If you remember, rats are afraid of the light. But soon, more rumbles are heard and felt, telling Amici and Lucas that more of the ravenous rodents are on the way. Suddenly, a literal tsunami of rats comes barreling through, killing the man and forcing Amici and Lucas to run like hell in the first of a few chase sequences involving the rats. They manage to escape, but that lasts all of five seconds when the rats burst through a grate in the wall. Luckily, there's a wall-mounted torch next to the door, keeping them safe from the rats for now. So begins Requiem's first rat-infested gauntlet, where we're shown, or rather reintroduced to, methods on how to navigate and or deal with the little biters, including now having to throw sticks, either burning to light out-of-reach braziers, or unlit to others so they can use them, the latter coming in handy here after Lucas once again falls and is separated from Amicia. Eventually, after getting an elevator working and being reintroduced to crafting alchemical ammo, we make it back outside. During the elevator ride, Amicia will comment how the rats appear faster, more agile, and more intelligent. It's Aqua 10 repeating itself, but with a more sinister purpose. Back outside, for now, we're afforded some respite, as we begin to cut through the slum towards the Order Tower. This doesn't last long, however, as we run into more mercenaries and even more rats, all of whom seem to be congregating around the tower's main entryway. However, the mercenaries, despite being amply supplied with torches, don't enter the tower, under orders to wait for their commander, a knight named Arnaud, who you might have heard mentioned a few times already. We eventually skirt around a lot of them and make it inside, but before we head in deeper, Amicia laments on everything that's presently transpiring around them. Previously, during their six months on the road, Hugo was worried that what happened in Aquitan would happen all over again. Amicia assured him that the worst was over, and in all fairness, it certainly looked that way. However, now that everything has gone to shit quick, fast, and in a hurry, she's worried, perhaps even scared, about what they're going to tell Hugo now, since this new home he already loves is already dying around them. Lucas reassures her, saying that no one could ever be prepared for this, and that, now that they have the Order on their side, things will get better, but I don't think Amicia truly believes this. After all, she hasn't exactly been shown to have the highest opinion of the Order, an opinion that, as of now, doesn't appear to be trajecting upwards. In the tower, we find Vodan hidden away in a secret laboratory, which we access by completing a puzzle that really isn't a puzzle since Lucas gives us the answers anyways, which I'm personally okay with since I absolutely hate puzzles in games to begin with. Vodan very quickly becomes wholly unlikable, coming off as bitter and haughty, not even turning to greet them, appearing rather unconcerned by events unfolding outside the tower, though he does give Amicia props for her handling of the Inquisition in Aquitaine. He refers to Amicia as the Carrier's Protector, a title that the Order has more or less foisted upon her without her permission, though by the way he says it, it's not a title that's just given to anyone, but one that's given by pure circumstance and is drenched in symbolism. Together, the three leave the tower to return to Hugo, though not before Amicia notices a rather peculiar fresco above Vodan's desk. That of an island with two conspicuous mountains, just like the one in Hugo's dream. Upon returning to the house, Vodan immediately goes to see Hugo. However, he wishes to work in silence and orders both Amicia and Lucas out of the room. Amicia protests, to which Beatrice promises to handle things in her stead. We then flash forward in time, perhaps a few hours. Amicia anxiously waits outside the room when we hear a cry from Hugo. Beatrice then bursts out of the room, calling for Lucas before informing Amicia that Hugo isn't reacting well to Vodan's treatment and is having a seizure. Amicia implores her to put a stop to whatever Vodan's doing, but Beatrice pretty much flat out refuses, saying that Hugo having a seizure was always likely, and that Vodan knows what he's doing because, in case you've forgotten, he's an expert on the macula. Beatrice tells Lucas to find a herbalist in the city outskirts, to get nightshade as soon as possible, so as to calm the tremors. Amicia deigns to go with him, feeling useless and, perhaps internally, helpless at the house. Amicia and Lucas set off, as a torrential downpour hammers the city. Amicia will express her frustrations at Vodan's behavior towards Hugo, then again when Lucas implores her to give the Magister more time, that it's all part of the process. She'll suggest that they need a new solution, like perhaps following Hugo's dream, that of the island. Lucas scoffs at the suggestion for how can a dream help them. It's from this conversation that we get our first point of disagreement between the two, which will be further expanded upon later, and, along with Amicia's disagreements with her mother, will have a considerable impact on the direction the story goes a little later. To reach the herbalist, we'll have to pass through the Butcher's District, the shortest means of getting to him. Complications quickly arise, however, when we find that it's been sealed off by Provencal's soldiers, with no one allowed in or out. 
With no other option, Amici and Lucas resort to sneaking in via a back way, one that leads directly into the butcher's dump. Don't think, just hold your breath. Unfortunately, this is only the beginning of our troubles. After losing control of a cart we try to move, rats emerge from underground. Simultaneously, we hear a scream from a nearby house and realize that the soldiers didn't evacuate the district before sealing it off, just like in the arena. Eventually, we run into a soldier who, in keeping with his orders, moves to kill them, forcing Amicia to take action and kill him first. We quickly discover that the soldiers are doing more than just abandoning people to the rats, but straight up purging the district. It's eerily similar to what the Inquisition was doing in the town in Innocence, though in that instance they had enough twisted decency to evacuate the townsfolk, even if forcefully, while only slaughtering the sick. Here in the Red City, everyone in the Butcher's District is condemned. From this point, we now have to deal with both rats and soldiers, even sicking the former against the latter. We eventually reach the gate out of the city where we see soldiers heading for the outskirts. Originally, Amici and Lucas believed the herbalist would be safe since he's outside the city, but now there's a very real possibility that the outskirts are also being purged, putting them in a race to find him before the soldiers do. We eventually make it outside the walls where, for a brief moment, we're afforded a chance to catch our breath, though everything continues to feel very off and disconcerting, Requiem continuing that ever-constant state of tension we discussed in the Innocence video. It doesn't take long for us to find yet more rats and soldiers, Amici and Lucas both suggesting that the rats are instinctively following the blood left by the soldiers and their purges, highlighting the utter futility of their attempt to quarantine them and the bite. Pressing on, we eventually find the herbalist, who in fact you'll have already interacted with during your search for Vodan, as well as his wife, a florist whose stall is located in the square where the fair is taking place. Unfortunately for us, the herbalist has been taken prisoner by some soldiers, his hands bound and being led away from his home. The soldiers need him and his plants, even though there are doctors and sick people that need him and his supplies. Upon seeing what the soldiers have done to his friends and neighbors, the herbalist gives the soldier escorting him a piece of his mind. In response, the soldier will punch him to the ground, then promptly kill him, despite saying only moments earlier that they needed him alive. There is no saving the herbalist here, for they're both surrounded by rats and extinguishing the soldier's torch will leave them both exposed to the little biters. Sniping the soldier with the sling will also extinguish the torch and we repeat the gruesome process. Amicia immediately begins to panic, for the herbalist was their only means of getting the nightshade. Lucas will respond by saying that he knows what the plant looks like and that all they need to do is get into the herbalist's shop. They manage to reach the gate, which is locked, but find an opening further along the wall that they can slip through. This opening leads directly to what appears to be the herbalist's workshop, where we begin to look around for nightshade. It's during this search that, if you approach a nearby pond, you'll find the herbalist's wife, murdered by soldiers. None of the plants outside are nightshade, much to Amicia's consternation. Heading inside the workshop, we don't have much luck either. We're then quickly forced to hide when we hear voices outside. It's here that we're introduced to the Beast, the man in charge of the purges as well as the seizure of any and all goods, mostly food and medicine, left in charge of the Red City and its outskirts by the Count of Provence. All that we know about him is learned through overheard conversations from soldiers, the majority of whom disapprove of his methods in dealing with the rats and the plague, methods that are only making things worse. However, they still follow him anyways. Given his rather intimidating presence, they do so probably more out of fear than any true loyalty. Soldiers spill out across the rest of the property. It's here that I want to point out Amicia's increasingly fragile mental state. You may notice over the course of this section her increasing trepidation and anxiety, given form by the panicked wavering in her voice that becomes more and more pronounced as the level goes on. This hasn't gone unnoticed by Lucas, and as they hide beneath the window of the workshop, he'll even point out at that very moment that she isn't even breathing, before she adds that she feels dizzy and that her heart is pounding. Lucas stands to find the nightshade alone, rightly reasoning that Amicia is in no state to continue. Amicia will attempt to protest, but Lucas doesn't give her an option, telling her to stay in the workshop while he sets off in search of the nightshade. As time passes and Lucas remains away, Amicia will begin to anxiously pace. She'll then hear him cry out from across the property. Though she's still in no shape to do it, with no other choice, Amicia jumps out of the workshop and begins to search for him. As we near a sort of greenhouse at the far end of the property, avoiding or killing soldiers all the while, we can hear Lucas being physically harmed, which draws Amicia's rapidly increasing ire. We eventually find Lucas in a barn, being accosted by a soldier, who we promptly dispatch. After checking on him, Lucas will state that he's found the nightshade and that they should go. A sound idea, as soldiers outside, drawn by the shouting, head for the barn to investigate. It's here that Amicia makes the ill-advised and ill-fated decision to stand and fight, under the pretense that they'll come after them and that she's tired of running. As more soldiers progressively enter the barn to engage her, Amicia falls into a blind rage and slays them all one by one, taunting them while she does it, while Lucas vainly begs her to stop and flee the barn. It's a sequence that, even now, I find rather disturbing. In Innocence, we saw Amicia become more than capable of killing out of spite and anger, but here she becomes fully unhinged, 
Her earlier anxiety and trepidation morphed into this blind rage that has, for lack of a better term, turned her into an unyielding, bloodthirsty monster. This is no doubt being further fueled by her anger at the carnage they've had to wade through, the thousands of corpses left by the soldiers, as well as the pervading sense of helplessness and frustration at Valdan's torturous treatment of Hugo. It's all gradually come together to form a swirling storm of rage around Amicia, one that has now become a full-on hurricane as she takes it out on any soldier that gets too close. Unfortunately, this action has drawn in the beast himself. Unable to harm him, Amicia can only look on in fear as the beast storms into the barn and takes a hold of her, bringing her rampage to a swift end. We transition to seeing Amicia and Lucas thrown into a cell, followed by another unknown jump in time where the beast informs them that they plan to let the executioner have a bit of fun with them before they're sentenced to the gallows. Well aware that their current predicament is because of her, Amicia will make the innocuous suggestion that Lucas should sit down, which is enough to set him off and leads to, in my opinion, one of the best scenes in the entire game. Before we get to it, however, I want to take a moment and highlight just how much better of a character Lucas is in Requiem when compared to Innocence. That's not to say that he was bad in the last game, far from it, but I always found him to be rather stiff and stifled by comparison to the rest of the gang, perhaps, I dare say, a bit one note in his characterization. By contrast, in Requiem, he's far more expressive and complex. I don't think the change in voice actor or accent alone did this, but also a change in how the character was directed, this new complexity taking form in his relationship with Amicia. He's, in essence, become not just her best friend, but also her closest confidant, but one that isn't afraid to challenge and confront her when he feels she's being unreasonable or out of line. We've seen this already in their disagreement regarding Voldan's treatment of Hugo, and we see it again here in the prison cell. He begins to berate her for her actions back at the barn, and rightly so, IMO. All they were supposed to do was get some herbs for Hugo. Instead, dozens of Provencal soldiers are dead, for which they're due to be hanged, and Hugo is probably still suffering. Not exactly part of the plan. Amicia inevitably breaks and accepts culpability for their predicament, before admitting, while fighting back tears, that she doesn't know what's going on inside her head, that she can feel her mind slipping away. She's well aware that her actions are far from normal for her, and it terrifies her. To that, Lucas responds with one of the best lines in the series, one that resonated with me more than I thought it would initially. Yes, because this world hurts, and it keeps hurting, and you want to hurt it back. But it's a fight you cannot win, Amicia. You are not them. You are the rune. It's at this moment that the call to prepare them for the gallows is made. Lucas, who hasn't been idle in plotting their escape, shows something to Amicia, something that works with fire, and tells her to give the order to use it when he's ready. They're led out of their cell by the beast, who makes them wait in front of the brazier for the executioner. It's at this point as well that Lucas will whisper that he's ready. While the beast waffles on about some self-indulgent bullshit, we give the signal and Lucas throws the mysterious item into the brazier. It's an alchemical creation Lucas calls stupefaccio, which can be used to blind and disorientate enemies. In this instance, to allow Amicia and Lucas to escape from the beast and his accompanying crony and climb some stairs. They eventually reach the top floor of whatever tower they're in, with the only exit being an open window. Jumping out of the window, they get a grand view of the entire city, the tower itself located in the castle that sits on a hill overlooking it. After skirting along a very narrow ledge, they clamber onto the castle's battlements, eventually reaching a balcony that overlooks the castle's main courtyard. There they spot a wagon, laden with goods brought in from the outskirts. Lucas reckons the nightshade will be on it, but Amicia insists that they need to return to Hugo and both deign to leave it behind. Continuing along, we eventually find the main gate. To get there, we have to pass through a larger building nearby. Upon entering this building, we discover that it's the depot we'll have heard about during our sneaking around, full of material goods and supplies. If we listen in on soldiers' conversations, we'll learn that the beast has ordered supplies to be gathered in the depot for the purposes of withstanding a siege. Food, medicine, weapons, and the like, along with any wealth they've recovered. Who they're planning to defend against is not entirely clear. My first thought went straight to the rats, which would be the most obvious answer, but after a soldier states indirectly that the entire city is being closed down and that no one will be able to leave, there's a suggestion that they intend to hold out against any violent mobs of desperate civilians trying to get out. The wagon from the outskirts was destined for the depot, which means that the nightshade should be somewhere here, as well as Amicia's sling, which was understandably taken from her after the beast got a hold of her. Eventually we find the nightshade in the sling. Now all we need to do is get out. Easier said than done, what with soldiers blocking the way to the main gate, and with no way to sneak around. They need a diversion, and find it in the form of a ballista. Lucas has enough materials to make a large quantity of stupefaccio, which he wants to stick to the end of a bolt. When fired, the friction of the bolt hitting something should be enough to create enough smoke to give them enough cover to escape. Of course, this is just pure speculation, though with no other option, they run with it anyways. After getting the ballista down and in position, the moment of truth arrives. 
Amicia fires the bolt through the depot doors, and as hoped, the stupefaccio creates a cloud of smoke that provides enough cover, and the two succeed in their escape. Sometime later, they make it back to the house, with Beatrice and Vodan waiting. Lucas, after covering for Amicia when Beatrice asks what took them so long, gives them the nightshade before Voldan and Beatrice go and see Hugo once again. We then jump forward by two days. Amicia is anxious to check on Hugo, but Lucas stops her. It's then that Voldan and Beatrice come out and we learn some cold, hard truths. Hugo is nearing the final threshold, a rare and critical event, one that can, and most likely will, cause terrible, tangible change if it isn't contained. For this reason, Hugo must be isolated from the outside world, with the Order having special buildings for just this purpose. This, of course, to Amicia, sounds like they just want to lock him away, probably to poke and prod him like some lab rat, no pun intended. By now it's clear to everyone, not just Amicia, that the more Hugo is hurt, the more rats appear and the more people die. Fodan will counter that that's why they must take Hugo away, before the asshole drops an absolute bombshell on us. Hugo is condemned, for the last threshold means the death of the carrier. Until he reaches this point, Hugo's powers will only grow, putting more people at risk. Amicia will attempt to bring up the fresco of the island in Vodan's laboratory, but the Magister simply calls it a child's fantasy. In any event, he wants everyone to head for the Order's headquarters in Marseille as soon as possible, a decision backed by Beatrice, much to Amicia's frustration. To that end, Vodan has a boat waiting for them, operated by a man named Joseph. As Vodan goes to rest, Beatrice asks Lucas to go and find Joseph. Lucas will then ask Amicia to come with him, which she does, and the two set off. Heading towards the harbor in the dead of night, we learn that a curfew has been put in place and that the entire city is under lockdown. Why isn't immediately apparent, though both Amicia and Lucas recall the butcher's district and what happened there, followed soon after by spotting a cart laden with corpses from the amphitheater. Reaching the harbor, we spot Joseph's boat on the far side. Now all we have to do is reach him. For that, we need to cut through the city docks, a task easier said than done, what with soldiers almost everywhere we look. Sneaking through the harbor sets us on the same path as another wagon, this one full of jars holding some unknown contents. We eventually catch up to the wagon as it gets stuck in some mud, in a part of the harbor that's been destroyed. What happened to this section of the harbor is never revealed, though judging by the leftover rat nests, it can be deduced that they had something to do with it. People tried to flee in a panic, which drew in the vermin, who inevitably chowed down. Now the soldiers with the cart full of jars are making the same mistake, panicking as they try to get free of the mud. In doing so, they're drawing in more rats, their arrival heralded by the telltale rumbling from below. Before they can make their escape, a swarm of rats burst through a nearby gate, nearly engulfing Amicia and Lucas, who are saved by the light of a torch pole, while the soldiers are swept away and devoured, their jars shattered and contents spilled everywhere. Amicia and Lucas are quickly surrounded, but luckily for them, the jar's contents was tar, which is highly flammable, which, when lit, allows them to reach another torch pole and a brazier on a cart before finally, albeit temporarily, getting clear of the rats. We end up in a tar workshop where we combine resin and a diluent, which turns out to be alcohol, to create pools of tar, which we light up to help navigate the workshop after more rats burst through. The workshop, in turn, proves to just be a precursor, or a sort of crash course as we have to repeat the process, albeit on a grander scale, in a yard beyond, where workers would have used the tar to seal bolt hulls. Further complicating matters is the presence of a soldier, who's become trapped by the rats. Ignoring the fact that they're breaking curfew, the soldier agrees to help Amicia and Lucas, and the three form an unlikely alliance to get to the other side of the yard. Eventually, the unlikely trio succeed in their respective goals, and all looks to be hunky-dory, until things dramatically go downhill when the soldier moves to escort them home, while Joseph's boat looms just behind him. Obviously, Amicia and Lucas refuse, and it's here that the soldier recognizes them as the kids from the outskirts. This forces Amicia into action, and, at Lucas' suggestion, we can throw Tar onto the soldier's torch to blind him, before giving him the slip. Passing through a building, we find Joseph being accosted by a soldier, who Joseph promptly knocks unconscious. He then casts off to escape, but Amicia and Lucas appear and beg for his help, adding that they have a child with them. Reluctantly, Joseph agrees and tells them to meet him at another pontoon further along the river. Following Joseph's boat takes us along the city walls, with soldiers everywhere, but we're aided by Joseph, who has a crossbow mounted on the bow and will fire bolts at soldiers as we go, at least in the first part of this section. Eventually, Joseph will get too far away to offer aid, and we're back on our own. Continuing along, we catch sight of a massive bonfire in the distance. Upon closer inspection, we'll notice that it isn't wood they're burning, but bodies. This is where the bodies of the plague victims end up, and not just them either. Overhearing a conversation between soldiers, we'll learn that the beast is emptying the entire city, killing anyone and everyone. In fact, most of the bodies brought to be burned weren't even sick to begin with. It's the beast's horrifying and downright appalling means of stemming the tide of the bite. Can't spread the plague if everyone's dead, after all. By extension, it's why the state's been put under lockdown, so that people can't leave and potentially spread the plague elsewhere before they've been put to the sword. 
Unfortunately for the Beast and his men, it's a plan that's already failed horribly. The buildup of corpses has only drawn in more rats, and by all accounts, the bite was already well entrenched in the city before the purges, as evidenced by what we saw at the amphitheater. Leaving the horror of the body bonfire behind, we pass through another gate and reach the other pontoon, with Joseph and his boat waiting for us. While speaking to Joseph, something in the ground violently stirs, an old too familiar sign that things are about to go very, very wrong. Now in a dangerous race against time, Amicia rushes back into the city to get Hugo and the others, instructing Lucas and Joseph to meet them at the docks near the house. In the city, we come across some civilians, awoken by the shaking, questioning a soldier as to what's going on. It's then that the ground stirs once again, which turns out to be the city's final death knell, as a literal tsunami of rats races down a nearby street, forcing them and Amicia to flee. So begins another chase sequence where all we have to do is run like goddamn hell back to the house, while the rats tear through everything in their path, consuming anyone caught in their wake, their screams ringing out as Amicia sprints past. We're afforded a brief reprieve where we catch sight of the house. However, it's also here that we just see how powerful Hugo, and by extension the rats, have become, when they quite literally destroy the castle at the top of the hill. Amicia is then almost swept away by the rats and the chase is back on. After scrambling over crumbling rooftops, we eventually make it back to the house, where we find Hugo in the throes of a seizure, Beatrice struggling to calm him down, while Voldan continues to be a grade A piece of shit. Amicia takes over from Beatrice, while Voldan gets his comeuppance and is killed. As Amicia attempts to calm Hugo down, we're shown an ominous shot of more rats bursting from the castle and pouring into the city. It's then that Hugo awakens and things begin to settle down. Beatrice wisely suggests that they leave, and they set out to meet Lucas and Joseph. Passing through the city, we bear witness to the devastation wrought by the rats, spurred on by Hugo's nightmare. It's a far cry from what we saw in Innocence. This is something more, in all the worst ways imaginable. Hugo, upon learning what happened from Amicia as she carries him, will become distraught and blame himself for the city's destruction, a city, let's not forget, he had come to love and looked forward to calling home. While Beatrice is at a loss for words, Amicia promises to find a way to rid him of the macula, and that she won't let him down. Before long, we find Lucas and Joseph at the docks, waiting for them. Once everyone's on board, they waste no time in casting off. Beatrice will share a bonding moment with her children, though, judging by Amicia's expression, all may not be well in the Darun family. As Joseph sets a course down the river, leaving the crumbling remains of the Red City behind. As morning dawns the next day, everyone on the boat is in a somber mood, the previous night still fresh in their minds. Despite putting some distance between themselves and the city, its aftermath continues to dog their proverbial steps, with hundreds, if not thousands of bodies flowing down the river alongside them. Amicia, Lucas, and Hugo have taken up residence in the cabin, with Hugo waking up from his dream with the Phoenix. He'll then make it clear to Amicia that he doesn't want to go to Marseille, a wish he first iterated as they walk through the ruined city, and that he wants to go to the island in his dreams, dead certain that it's there that he'll be cured. Beatrice will then enter the cabin and wish to have a private word with Amicia, and it's here that we witness the rising tension between mother and daughter take shape, and has been doing so since Voldan first arrived at the house back in the Red City. Beatrice is still set on going to Marseille, even after everything Voldan did, while Amicia wants nothing to do with the Order anymore. Though she may not have a plan of her own, or is not yet entirely sold on looking for Hugo's island, to Amicia anything is better than the goddamn Order. Neither one of them is willing to budge, though Beatrice, to her credit, does acknowledge that Amicia and Hugo share a bond that she can't even begin to understand. It's the one thing in this instance they agree on, though Amicia is rather cutting in her response. You're right. You just don't understand. Before their argument can come to a head, Joseph calls from outside and Amicia goes to investigate, leaving Beatrice to dwell on what's been said. At the risk of sounding like she's free of any culpability, I can't help but feel some amount of sympathy for Beatrice. She's caught between two worlds, two modes of thought which are incessantly clashing with one another. On the one hand, she's a magistra of the Order of Alchemists, which no doubt carries with it a considerable amount of expectation, such as towing the Order line, or perhaps more accurately, remaining in keeping with their established doctrine, such as taking the carrier to one of their special buildings when needs necessitate. On the other, she's a mother who wants to do what's best for her children, one of whom just so happens to be the carrier, and I suspect that, in her heart of hearts, she knows that taking Hugo to the Order will only make things worse, if not immediately, then further down the road. Yet, this goes directly against the Order's mandate, and thus we circle back to what's expected of her as a magistra, thus spurring this inner conflict within her soul, with the Order and Amicia representing each side of it. 
So far we've seen Beatrice lean heavily towards the Order, for the reason we just established, but also because it's the only concrete path laid before them. Despite his insistence on finding it, Hugo's Island is still a massive question mark as of now and thus can't be entirely relied upon. However, it's for that reason that Beatrice is not free of any culpability for what happened to Hugo in the Red City. I suspect at any point she could have told Vodan to stop, but doesn't even try. It's like her motherly instinct is shut off as soon as the bastard showed up. This conversation with Amicia, particularly after she leaves the cabin, is where I think she begins to realize that she's been wrong to stay true to the Order, though as evidenced by later dialogue, she isn't ready to give up on it just yet. The boat has gotten stuck on some debris. Hopping off, Amicia and Lucas push it free, but are now stuck on the bank as Joseph is unable to stop. With no other choice, they look for a way to link back up with the others, who carry on down the river. While searching for a way around, Amicia will make clear her desire to find Hugo's island. Lucas will ask about her mother, to which Amicia will answer that she doesn't care what she does, before adding that Lucas will need to pick a side, which I think is rather unfair on her part, as it puts Lucas in a rather difficult position. Lucas has stood by Amicia on more than a few occasions, through all sorts of horror and danger, yet none of that seems to matter anymore as Amicia point blankly states he needs to pick a side, as if it were that simple. Lucas has, to a degree, towed the Order line, as evidenced by his early defense of Vaudin and he and Amicia's disagreements regarding Hugo's island, but I think this can be boiled down to the simple fact that he's Beatrice's apprentice. In fact, I think he's more loyal to Beatrice than he is to the Order, and thus remains somewhat in lockstep with her. That said, he's simultaneously loyal to Amicia and Hugo, and wants to do right by them. So far he's managed to navigate these opposed loyalties well enough, but now they're actively butting heads, which has put him between a hard rock and an even harder place. Now, to top this all off, Amicia is demanding that he choose between these loyalties without so much as taking into consideration Lucas's position in all of this. I can appreciate that Amicia isn't perhaps in the best headspace at this moment, but I find it rather harsh and short-sighted on her part to make such a strict demand of her closest friend, who can't just make that decision rashly. Following a narrow forest path, Amicia and Lucas come upon a cliff edge overlooking an abandoned work site, where a bridge was previously being constructed. From this vantage point, we can see the others, Joseph managing to bring the boat close to shore, who in turn spot them. Just as we're about to clamber down some scaffolding to rejoin them, the rats decide now is a good time to reappear, bursting from beneath and, naturally, spreading out across the worksite, locking the duo's means of reaching the boat. So begins the laborious task of getting back to the boat while circumventing the rats, which is mostly done by way of cranes carrying bundles of hay that can be set alight, though only temporarily, and can only be moved along a fixed axis. We're also introduced to pyrite, a mineral that generates light on impact and, as you can see here, serves as a means of escape from the vermin should they catch you without light, and will save your ass more than a few times, especially if you have a more aggressive playstyle. Amicia and Lucas eventually make it back to the boat, but there's another problem. A chain operating a pontoon across the river is blocking the way. To that end, we need to cross by way of the pontoon, though not before having to remove a corpse that's jamming the chain. Once across, we break the chain, though it takes the pontoon with it, forcing us to find an alternate means to get back across, which we do via arguably convoluted means on the incomplete bridge further along. While we're doing this, Lucas, for some unknown reason, ventures from the boat and disappears. Suddenly, as just we're about to finish up, we spot Lucas getting quartered by some of the mercenaries we encountered back in the Red City. Acting fast, Amicia takes control of the mounted crossbow and kills the mercenaries, before helping him evade the rats by way of flaming bolts stuck into crates, opening a path back to the boat. Once Lucas is back on board, Joseph will get the boat going again, and it's here that the mysterious mercenary leader, Arno appears on a nearby cliff. So here's the famous girl with the sling. It seems you're pretty versatile when it comes to killing my men. Wasting no time conversing with him, Amicia shoots open a floodgate and the boat carries on down the river, beginning an intense on-rail section where we man the crossbow and take down Arno's men as they attempt to stop the boat. After passing through a gorge, it'll appear that we've managed to give them the slip, at least for now until Joseph takes an arrow through the neck, and the mercenaries use grappling hooks to pull the boat ashore. Seeing little choice, Amicia grabs the crossbow, knocked free by another hook, and heads ashore to take on the mercenaries directly. Once they're taken care of, Amicia will follow a path that leads up to a tree where the grapple hooks are tied. While attempting to cut the ropes and free the boat, Arno will appear and look to kill her, taking Amicia up on her stupidly ill-advised demand that he show himself, one that she made back on the riverbank. No doubt regretting this, Amicia flees with Arno in hot pursuit. The chase takes us around a small mountain and eventually leads to a small cave network where Arnaud leaves the hunt for his men so as to go deal with the others, still back on the boat. The chase is back on once we leave the caves, as yet more mercenaries appear on the heights above, and instead of fighting, we run like hell back to the boat, just as Arnaud looks to board himself. Amicia challenges Arnaud, which may appear like yet another dumb decision on her part, though I'd argue she doesn't have a choice here. That said, Arnaud, fully armed and armored, has his way first kicking her, then immobilizing her with a strike to the head, leaving a nasty wound in the process. Arnaud, however, instead of killing Amicia then and there, pulls a Nicholas, stands over her, and gloats. 
This gives Hugo enough time to break free of Beatrice's hold and jump ashore, before summoning rats from below to chase Arno and his men away, saving Amicia in the process. It's then that one of the grapples breaks free of the boat. As Amicia and Hugo check on one another, Beatrice will tell them to come back, and it's here that the siblings make a fateful decision. As the last grapple breaks free and the boat begins to glide down the river, they remain on the riverbank. Nothing is said, for the message is clear. They're going to look for the island of Hugo's dream. All the while, Beatrice and Lucas look on helplessly as the boat slips from view. Amicia, who will appear resolute in her decision initially, will then show a brief look of self-doubt once the boat is gone and Hugo embraces her, perhaps unsure as to whether she made the right decision. Nevertheless, the die is cast. There's no going back. Let's go find your island. We briefly jump forward in time to find Amicia and Hugo heading down a road. After briefly stopping by a stream to tend to Amicia's head wound, and where Hugo will make a sculpture of his dream island in the sand, they come upon a wide open field. Here, Amicia challenges Hugo to a foot race to a tree on the far side. She does this to help take Hugo's mind off Beatrice and Lucas, who he's worried about, a worry he first expresses just before they make for the stream. During this race, Amicia will briefly suffer from her head wound, slowing her down. It's an issue that will persist throughout this section and only get worse and worse the further along we go. Continuing along the stream, we start to hear some sort of chanting from the forest beyond, like you would hear at a church mass. Cresting a small hill, we find a sprawling camp nestled in the woods, the chants coming from deeper in. Approaching the camp, we're greeted by a woman who informs them that they're pilgrims. Amicia immediately realizes that they're on their way to Rome for next year's Jubilee, which she mentions to Hugo shortly after when he asks. Jubilees are special years in Western Christianity, celebrating the remission of sins and universal pardon. In Leviticus, the third book of the Old Testament, Jubilees are mentioned to occur every 50 years, during which slaves are freed, debts are forgiven, and God's mercies would be particularly manifest. The Jubilee of 1350 saw many visits to the Archbasilica of St. John Lateran, St. John the Baptist often seen as a symbol of repentance for one's sins by way of baptism, hence his sanctification as the Baptist. With all that in mind, it seems only fitting that Amicia, of all people, would come upon a camp full of pilgrims heading to a Jubilee that will inevitably see a sharp focus being placed on St. John, especially when considering the many sins she's committed so far. The woman will direct the siblings to a man named Perrault, the leader of the pilgrims, for he knows the region well and may be able to set them on the path to Hugo's island. We find him leading mass in some ruins, the entrance into which we must wait at until he's finished. Once that's done, the siblings will ask about the island. Perrault doesn't recognize it from memory, but does mention that he has some old maps of the Mediterranean and offers to let them have a look, an offer they gladly accept. And it's here that the beast re-emerges. Clearly unwilling to let go of what happened back in the Red City, he's either somehow managed to track Amicia and Hugo to the camp, or both parties happen to arrive at the same time in one big old goddamn coincidence. Perrault quickly picks up on the guilt written all over Amicia's expression. Instead of handing them over, however, he proves himself to be a bro, refusing to give up a child, and instructs the siblings to follow him. You could say, he's a pair bro. <laughs> oh, that was terrible, I'm sorry. We follow Pero through the camp as the beast's men search tents and question pilgrims, even hiding under a cart at one point while he misdirects a group of soldiers and sends them away. From there, Pero sends us on our way across a pen, where, on the other side, is a path that will lead us to the sea. Unfortunately, we don't make it even more than 10 yards down the path before we're spotted and javelins come flying in. A soldier will even get a hold of Amicia, who manages to kick him off, but in doing so, both she and Hugo are sent tumbling down into a ravine, which in turn reopens the wound on her head, and she begins to suffer more as a result. They end up at a quarry, which they proceed to go through. However, Hugo will tell Amicia to stop. He can hear people, even though neither we nor Amicia can see nor hear anyone. Hugo will then reveal that, through his connection with the rats, he can feel the soldier's presence. This grants us the ability called Echo, where Hugo can use his connection to pinpoint the location of soldiers within a certain range during particular sequences throughout the story after this point. It's an ability that shares certain characteristics with other similar abilities, such as The Witcher 3's Witcher Vision, Horizon Forbidden West's Focus Pulse, or Assassin's Creed Valhalla's Odin's Sight, to name a few, and is quite a helpful aid when analyzing enemy patrol patterns or orientating yourself during certain segments. We eventually make it through the quarry, but Amicia's condition is getting worse, suffering from dizziness and shortness of breath while also struggling to stay conscious. Once it passes, the siblings deign to cross a wide open area to the safety of a building on the far side. Naturally, that means more soldiers appear, though like many of the levels before, we have a few options as to how we can proceed. We eventually make it to the building and slip inside, but as soon as we do, Amicia suffers from another bout of dizziness, weakness, and severe pain, and there begins to be a very real worry that she won't make it much further. 
We enter a workshop, but before we can continue, Amicia suffers another attack and falls to the floor, before passing out completely, while a panicked Hugo tries to get her up. Rats then suddenly burst into the workshop, their inevitable appearance here foreshadowed by the many dead bodies scattered about, which show clear signs of being devoured. Soldiers will then join in on the far side, drawn to the noise. Hugo, becoming even more panicked, will then enter some sort of trance, and take control of the rats. Using them, we kill the soldiers in quick succession before Hugo is snapped out of his trance and Amicia suddenly regains consciousness. More soldiers enter and we repeat the process, this time with Amicia bearing witness. As we begin to traverse the rats, she's quick to tell Hugo to be careful with such power. After all, the macula wants to consume Hugo, and taking control of the rats, getting inside their heads, will only lead to that if he does it too often. Beyond is another open area with both soldiers and small packs of rats. Through Hugo, we can take control of these rats and sick them on most of the soldiers, at least those not carrying a torch, making this section a walk in the park by comparison to the one prior. Our path then leads through a small fortlet, where we run into the beast. How we managed to get here way ahead of us after we left it behind the pilgrim's camp, I don't know. In any event, we have no choice but to face him, and in truth, it's high time we put him down anyway. The fight with the beast works similarly to the fight with Conrad Malfour at the beginning of Innocence. Unlike Conrad, who needs all his armor stripped before he takes a stone to the head, the beast only needs his chest piece broken off before sticking him with a crossbow bolt. Some of his men will also join in on the action, turning the fight into a bit of a juggling act, one that can go against you if you aren't careful. Nevertheless, once the beast is put down and his men are taken care of, we can finally rest easy. Except we can't, because Amici begins to struggle once again, the stress of the fight adding to the considerable strain she's already feeling. After exiting the fortlet, Amici will begin to feel faint again, her head wound bleeding again, and badly. More soldiers appear, and Amicia, unable to fight, implores Hugo to conjure the rats and take care of them. Rats burst forth and we take control and send them against the soldiers, who quickly devour them. As this goes on, Hugo will become more and more irate, and slowly begin to lose control, the macula taking advantage of his duress to overtake him. Amici will implore him to remain calm, before pleading that he stop when it's clear that he's no longer in control of himself or the rats. Unfortunately, it's too late, and Hugo has a seizure, overwhelmed by the macula. Just like in the Red City, this causes a literal tidal wave of rats to appear, and Amicia is forced to grab Hugo and carry him, taking a flight of stairs. As we do, more rats appear from every possible opening and begin to pursue the siblings as they seek high ground. We eventually reach a ledge where Amicia manages to get Hugo up, but becomes stuck in the process, unable to reach herself. Amicia quickly resigns herself to her fate, while Hugo desperately calls to her. It's then that a certain figure appears. We get another flash forward in time, to find Amicia resting against a tree. Hugo is here as well, and we soon learn who it was that saved her from the rats. Arno? Seeing him renders her unconscious again, probably due to shock. After another couple time jumps, encompassing roughly two days, we find ourselves on the coast. Arno knows of the island they seek, called Lacuna, as well as the means to get there. In those two days, he's also treated Amicia's wound, cleaning it and bandaging it. Despite all this, saving her life, treating her wound, the one he ironically gave her, and knowing the way to Hugo's dream island, Amicia naturally doesn't trust Arnaud. She eventually demands to know why he saved her and why she shouldn't just kill him. Arnaud's answer is simple. He and his men are on the run from the army of Provence, Arnaud being the most wanted among them. Having seen what Hugo's capable of, he reckons his safest bet is to roll with the Daroons, having seemingly already forgiven Amicia for killing dozens of his men. In return for keeping him alive, he'll take them to Lacuna. Amicia, still distrustful of him, agrees with this plan, though not without giving the knight a stern warning. Be very careful. This is a constant reminder that I should kill you. From there we reunite with Hugo and get a glimpse of the Mediterranean and learn more about where we're going. Obviously, we need a boat. Arnaud happens to know someone who does, a smuggler named Sophia, who not only can get them to Lacuna, but do so quickly and discreetly. Her hideout is further along the coast, which we begin to follow, but before we continue, I want to address something about Arnaud that has bugged me on every playthrough I've done of this game. You may recall, back in the Red City, Arnaud and his mercenaries were hunting Vodan in the amphitheater, even making it as far as the front entrance of his tower. A big deal is made about this, and yet we never learn why they were looking for him. It's inferred that they wanted him so he could help with the bite, but this is never confirmed and it comes across as a loose end that's never explained. The reason this bothers me is that Amicia really should be asking Arno about it. After all, her clashing with his men in the amphitheater to get to Voldan is what led to Arno chasing her and the others along the river afterwards, culminating in their confrontation on the riverbank. Instead, the matter is never brought up. I'm not going to be so brazen and call it a plot hole since it's ultimately inconsequential to the rest of the story, but it's yet another instance of a moment in the narrative spanning both games that receives considerable attention but is never resolved or explained. 
The path to Sophia's hideout takes us through a series of caves along the shore where we inevitably run into more rats. In fact, they've got a nest, one that we need to pass through. In the nest, we're reintroduced to Odorus, which we use to rescue Arnaud after he falls into the nest. We're offered a brief reprieve on the shores of an inlet before pressing on into another set of caves where, along with the rats, we run into some Provencal soldiers. Arnaud's men aren't the only ones being hunted. Being a smuggler and, according to Arnaud, one with a notorious reputation, Sophia's also high on the Provencal shit list. We eventually reach Sophia's hideout, and just as one might expect when meeting with a known criminal, we receive a warm welcome from Sophia and her boys. It's here that we're finally introduced to Sophia, nicknamed the Sea Scorpion. Arnaud will ask Sophia to take them to Lacuna, no questions asked, but Sophia is quick to turn them down. With the Provencal army on their back and thousands of rats taking up residence on her doorstep, she's disbanding her crew and calling it quits on her smuggling operation. Arnaud will insist, asking her to come alone, before calling in a favor, one that, as we'll learn later, stems from Arnaud not killing Sophia when he was ordered to years earlier. At this, Sophia relents and agrees to take them to Lacuna, though on one condition, Amicia's head wound having not gone unnoticed. Don't be ashamed, sweetheart. It suits you. If you ever hurt her in front of me, I'll kill you. <laughs> Deal. Sophia tells them to go on ahead, for she wants to have a final word with her crew. All two of them. However, before we go, she reveals that soldiers may have taken her ship into dry dock, meaning that we'll undoubtedly have to forcefully liberate the vessel from their clutches. Great. Stepping outside, we see that a storm has begun to batter the coast. Nevertheless, we push on along the beach, which is crawling with soldiers, the end goal being a fishing village across the bay, signified by a single lighthouse. Right off the hop, we get a glimpse of Arnaud in action. From this initial encounter, we gain the ability to command Arnaud to engage soldiers in one-on-one -on -one combat, an ability that will get us through most of the encounters during this segment and is most effective when used in tandem with Amicia's own abilities. Naturally, the rats become involved about midway through, though they don't become much of an issue on their own until we reach the fishing village, though we can use Hugo's ability to control small swarms of them in some instances to aid our progress, if we so choose. Reaching the village, as before, we have multiple ways to get around. We eventually catch sight of Sophia's ship, called Larascas, named after a species of venomous scorpion fish of the same name, which can be found throughout the Mediterranean. We eventually reach a small house at the far end, with Larascas just outside. There the trio decide to wait for Sophia, Hugo Arnaud going out to explore the ship, while Amicia waits inside to rest, her head wound coming back with a vengeance. After some time passes, Amicia hears banging on the door, followed by panicked pleas to open up, possibly from Sophia. As she does, the door bursts open and Sophia is thrown in by a soldier, who then proceeds to start choking her to death. Acting fast, Amicia takes a knife off the soldier's belt and kills him, saving Sophia, who comes off as the opposite of grateful when she expresses concern over the fact that she now owes Amicia, then doubles down when Amicia replies that she owes her nothing. In any event, the gang is free to go ahead and set sail, even as the storm continues to pound down on the coast. We find Hugo and Arnaud on the ship, and with the latter following Sophia's instructions, we free the ship from its captivity. With the ship now free, we can finally begin to make our way to Lacuna, filled with the optimism that maybe, just maybe, we'll finally free Hugo of the curse in his blood. After a brief jump in time, we find ourselves on board Larascas as the sun shines down on the Mediterranean. Here we're afforded some time to do some limited exploring of the ship, both on our own and with Hugo, as well as to speak to Sophia and Arnaud. During this, we learn a bit more about Arnaud specifically, both from him and Sophia, chiefly that he's carrying some amount of emotional turmoil, brought with him from time spent fighting in Aquitain against the English, and manifested by his broken shield, his coat of arms having seen better days as well. It's while speaking with Sophia, Hugo will call Amicia to the bow, where he's caught sight of something. Peering into the hazy horizon, something does indeed come into view. The two teeth, the mountains of Hugo's dream. They finally reached Lacuna. It's then, after a brief moment of excitement, Hugo will tell Amicia, rather off the cuff, that it's not important if he dies. Back in the Red City, most likely when Amicia was out of the house with Lucas, Vodan told him as much what happened eventually, and Hugo has, by all accounts, accepted this grim inevitability. Amicia, understandably, doesn't take this well, and looks to be on the verge of a panic attack when Sophia, rather gingerly, informs them that they'll be making land soon, and that she needs Amicia's help. It's a scene and conversation that, despite appearances, is a rather important one, though I can't say why just yet, as it will need to be taken in context with later scenes and beats, so make a mental note of it for now. 
Arriving at a small seaside village, we're greeted by one of the locals who gives Hugo a crown of flowers, and from whom we first learn of the Brighter Days, a festival that just so happens to be going on, and of the Child of Embers, a pagan deity that the people seem to worship. Heading into the village with Arno, who's offered his aid, we come upon a market fair where we can begin to ask around about the phoenix and the healing pond on the island. If you remember, in Hugo's dream, he was cured of the macula by the water of this special pond. Alas, no one in the market knows of any phoenixes or special ponds. Hugo expresses some disappointment, but it doesn't last long. For the most part, he's just happy that they've found the island of his dreams and that it's just as beautiful and vibrant as it was then. After we ask enough people, we eventually hear that the Brighter Days' festivities are about to begin and head further into the village to investigate. These include dancers, revelers, and a singing procession that marches through the village. Onlookers will throw flowers and bless them as they pass, including Hugo, who perhaps gets a little carried away. Hugo, blessed be everyone! <laughs> oh lord, it's done! It becomes rather clear as we explore what limited portion of the village we can that the people of Lacuna are happy and prosperous, events on the continent barely registering to them if they're even aware of them at all. This, I think, is in large part thanks to the island's relative isolation, given that it's inferred multiple times to be hard to find, though it would also seem that, if the villagers are to be believed, the Child of Embers they worship is a rather generous patron. It could be argued that this worship of a clearly non-Christian deity is only possible thanks to this isolation, for, as it's pointed out a few times throughout our stay, the church would no doubt consider this pagan worship to be utter heresy, and if you have even a passing knowledge of medieval religious history, then you know how the church might react if they ever found out. Following the procession takes us to a sort of square where a great many people have gathered. It's here that we're finally introduced to Victor de Arles, Count de Provence, and the very man who supposedly ordered the purging of the Red City and its people. Or maybe not. We'll get to that. For those of you who may be wondering, Victor is not an historical figure, nor is he based on one, insofar as I've been able to research. He's a wholly created character by a sobo. The true Count of Provence in 1349 was Louis of Taranto, who was also simultaneously King of Naples, Count of Falcalquier, and Prince of Taranto, gaining all these titles, save for the princedom, through his marriage to Joanna I, who was also his first cousin. Victor begins to give a speech to the crowd when a woman named Emily, their priestess, fails to appear. As this is going on, Arnaud, who grows noticeably angry at seeing the Count, will take Hugo to the front and order him to conjure the rats. As you may have already expected, Arnaud's aid in getting the Daroons to Lacuna wasn't just some selfless act. Arnaud and Hugo have struck an accord. As a repayment for saving Amicia's life and getting them to Lacuna, Hugo will help Arnaud kill Victor. It's not clear when this deal, if we can call it that, was struck, though it's most likely to have been when Hugo and Arnaud were exploring La Rascasse while Amicia was resting and waiting for Sophia, Arnaud by now having seen fully what Hugo is capable of. Amicia, understandably, isn't down with this. I think we can all agree with her that it's taking advantage of a child. This hasn't gone unnoticed by the Count, who draws his sword upon seeing Arnaud, who quite literally says, fuck it, and goes to confront him. Victor decides to take on Arnaud while ordering his men to catch Amicia and Hugo. We begin to dash through the village while the Count's soldiers seek to corner us in a chase sequence that's very similar to the one we do early in Innocence. We eventually take shelter in an empty house, where Hugo becomes rather despondent, the island of his dreams very quickly turning to shit, just like everywhere else. After taking a moment to think, Amicia decides that they're going to go back and stop Arnaud before he does any more damage and save Hugo's dream. To do that, they need to get back, discreetly if possible. For starters, we need to get out of the compound we find ourselves in after exiting the house, doing so by finding a cart that gets us to an upper level and over a locked gate, one that just so happens to overlook the square where everything kicked off. While getting the cart into position, Amicia will ask Hugo why Arnaud attacked Victor, who will answer that it's because of the Count that Arnaud's shield is broken. Jumping down into the square, we find that we're not alone. One of the Count's men is there, watching over the immediate vicinity with a falcon on his arm. This falcon is trained to kill, and will swoop down and do just that if it catches you in the open. To that end, we must move from cover to cover, making sure not to get caught by the Falcon's talents. This can be done by either timing our movements to the Falcon's attacks, or by distracting the bird and opening a window of opportunity to move. While offering little, if any, in the way of story, from a gameplay perspective I found this section to be quite neat and mechanically interesting, as well as somewhat terrifying, especially if you have a close call with the bird, and I find it somewhat disappointing that this sort of gauntlet or mini-boss encounter isn't used again for the rest of the game. After getting through this encounter, we continue through the village and find Arnaud and Victor still duking it out. Thinking fast, Amicia collapses a post that knocks down Arnaud, who's quickly seized by the Count's men. Victor then looks set to deal some punishment to the Daroons, but is stopped at a woman's behest. No, wait! Victor, stop!
meet Emily, Victor's wife and the priestess everyone was waiting for back at the square before everything kicked off. Her presence, along with her words, quickly calms the evidently agitated Count, a calm only broken briefly when Arnaud starts spouting off again before the bastard is taken away and thrown in prison. With that settled, Emily invites Amici and Hugo to their place for dinner and offer Victor supports as a sort of recompense for helping take down Arnaud. We then jump to the front of the terrace of the Count and Countess's palace, where we follow them inside. We're given a tour of the palace by Emily and Victor as they lead the siblings to their room, where they can spend the night and freshen up. As we do, we learn more about the strange religion of Lacuna, the one centered around the Child of Embers. Emily is referred to as the Mother by the people of Lacuna, though it's not clear whether this is simply because of the ongoing brighter days, or if it's a title she bears year-round. By extension, as we'll learn later, Victor is referred to as the Father, though it seems this title is only relevant during particular rituals or situations, as almost everyone refers to him as Count. Emily very much embodies her role, her mannerisms and demeanor that of a kind and caring mother figure who only wants best for her flock, whom I believe she considers to also be her children in a roundabout way, though not in the same way as the Child of Embers. Like the rest of the islanders, Emily attributes Lacuna's prosperity to the Child of Embers and create the brighter days to give thanks and celebrate the child, who, according to Emily and Victor, is foretold to return to them, the mother and father, and the people that revere him. Interestingly, they don't view this child as a god, but a long sleeping child their child. A particular and noteworthy distinction that may appear a tad bit odd at first, but will come back and make more sense later. We eventually come upon an altar near the heart of the palace, bearing the image of this mysterious child, with a phoenix above it, just like the one from Hugo's dream. The siblings, continuing to be good and gracious guests, join Emily in prayer before the altar, before asking to take some time to pray for their father. Instead, however, once Emily's out of earshot, Amicia will ask Hugo if the bird on the altar is the same bird as his dream, which he confirms it to be. We continue to follow Emily and Victor, who take us to the bedroom they fitted out for the Daroons and plan to get them a fresh change of clothes, which is far more than the siblings could have asked for. Hugo will then inexplicably ask Victor if he's going to kill Arnaud. The Count states that Arnaud will be judge, inferring that he's guilty of a lot more than what we've seen from him, though offers Hugo a chance to testify if he wishes. Speaking of the Count, now that he once again has our attention, let's massively segue for a moment and return to what I said when we first meet him. Back then, I suggested that he may not be responsible for the purging of districts within and without the Red City, despite the soldiers wearing his colors, that of Provence. Though it's never confirmed, it's strongly hinted that he leaves the running of the county to his direct subordinates, men like the Beast, who in turn act of their own accord, but do so in Victor's name. But why? Again, while never confirmed outright, all indications would suggest that he, along with Emily, has taken up permanent residence in Lacuna. After all, they're the head of a pagan religion only found on this island, and I severely doubt they'd have gone to great pains to make their palace what it is if they didn't intend to live there full time. Being that getting to and from Lacuna isn't exactly an easy thing to do, Victor would have to realistically leave the running of the rest of Provence in the hands of his underlings, men again like the Beast. Of course, that means there was no oversight regarding the Beast's actions, which could be rightly seen as Victor being complicit in allowing it to happen, though it could be argued that he's not even aware of what's going on back on the mainland, and thus his only crime is being a very poor judge of character. Emily and Victor leave Amicia and Hugo alone in the room, and extend an offer to explore Lacuna as they please. Once the Count and Countess leave, the siblings enjoy their new comfy environs, their prospects starting to look up. The next morning, after changing into their fresh new clothes, they leave the inner palace out onto the terrace which we can explore at our leisure. While there isn't anything of note to find, Amici and Hugo will make comments at certain elements of this area. You can tell the Count is rich. How? He has too many ponds. <laughs> that is very true. <laughs> Once we're ready, we can exit out of the palace proper where we're greeted by Sophia, who has been languishing inconspicuously by the front entrance for some unknown time. Not one to be idle, she hung around the village, observing and listening. It's through these means that she discovered that Amici and Hugo were at the Count and Countess's palace and that Arnaud had been imprisoned. She strikes a nerve with Amicia when she gives her a hard time about what happened, which draws Amicia's ire. In truth, Sophia's just teasing her, though she likes what she hears from Amicia, her teasing doubling is a sort of litmus test to see if she can trust her. It's here that Sophia joins us and we begin to explore. Following the path down from the palace, we come upon a statue of a phoenix, like the one from Hugo's dream, and the one on the altar we saw inside the palace earlier. The statue, interestingly, is looking in a particular direction. Following this would-be path, we find another phoenix statue just like the one before, but this one is looking in a different direction, one which we can follow, if we so choose. Following the birds will guide us to the next stage of the story, but also serves as a means of gently exposing us to the different locales scattered across this small slice of lacuna, which we can then explore if we wish. 
Some of these can be interacted with, such as the four windmills we find which we can muck around with if we like, though the end result still eludes me. There's also some amount of organic storytelling to be found as well, especially that which concerns the brighter days and the Child of Embers, where we can catch a glimpse of one of their rituals, centered around a flowered adored tree, while others prepare the area next to it for a later feast. While nothing close to a full-blown open world, and nor should it be, it's a nice change of pace from the constant skulking and fighting and chaos and straight-up trauma we'll have become accustomed to throughout the series so far, reminiscent of the market portions in the Red City and the Island Village, but on a somewhat grander, more open scale. It also serves well as a means for allowing Sophia to become integrated with the Daroons more naturally, as she, in effect, takes over for Lucas. This comparison will become more apparent later on, for at this early stage, both Sophia and the Daroons are still getting to know each other somewhat, this early exploratory section allowing this to happen more organically. As mentioned only a moment earlier, following the Phoenix statues takes us along a path towards the next stage of the story, a path that eventually guides us to some secluded ruins in and around the center of the explorable area, akin to some sort of theater. Exploring the ruins, we find a fresco at its center. Most of it is covered in long grass, save for one aspect. An image of the Child of Embers and the Phoenix, exactly like the altar back at the palace. Amicia deduces that there may be more under the grass and decides to clear it. To do this, we need to throw a pot full of Ignifer onto the grass, which quickly burns it, revealing the rest of the fresco. Turns out the fresco is a map of the island, with this theater and fresco at its center, connected to various locations across the island. Hugo also point out that it's similar in its composition to the crest of the Order of Alchemists, suggesting that there's a connection between them and the Child of Embers. From here, Amicia will begin to explain to Sophia why they came to Lacuna. To get away from the Order because they wanted to lock Hugo away because of his illness, and that Lacuna just may hold the means of helping him get better. It's important to note that Amicia is pretty vague on details regarding Hugo's sickness. This is for obvious reasons, and she will progressively reveal more as the story goes along, willing or otherwise, but there's a deeper, more personal reason that will reveal itself later, so make a mental note of that. As just mentioned, the fresco depicts certain locations across the island. One of these Sophia immediately recognizes. The two mountains, known as Las Madres, the Mothers. On the mountain is a sanctuary, one that's supposedly hundreds of years old. Given what we just learned, there's a good chance it could hold the answers we seek. Climbing up the mountain, we eventually come upon a gate where we find a herdsman and his goats. According to the herdsman, the gate's closed, for a ceremony is about to take place at the sanctuary. The herdsman, after some gentle prodding from Amicia, will then tell us that the goat path to the left will get us closer to the sanctuary, but that we'll have to look from afar. Victor and Emily are up there, and the guards are still on edge after Arno's actions the day before. The trio decide to take this path, their curiosity piqued. As Sophia puts it, on the bright side, you don't lock a place down if it doesn't hold something important. Following the path, along which we can rescue one of the herdsman's goats that got separated, we drop down into an area just in front of the main gate and bridge leading to the sanctuary with soldiers everywhere. This section is entirely stealth-based. You cannot be caught or the mission will fail. You also can't kill any soldiers. After all, we're the ones that are technically trespassing, and the soldiers of the island, who are considerably more friendly than their comrades back on the continent, haven't done or aren't doing anything wrong, just going about their business. It's during this initial phase that Sophia pulls a trick out of her sleeve. Back on the Raskast, while exploring the ship, you may find a prism amongst her belongings. This prism can focus and reflect sunlight, and in this instance, Sophia can use it to burn small portions of tall grass, creating smoke, which will distract the guards. I think you get the idea. After getting through the gate and crossing over the bridge, where Hugo nearly falls, a moment that always makes my heart leap into my throat, we make it onto the main grounds of the sanctuary, where we once again repeat the process with Sophia's prism and the tall grass, this time with multiple ways to get around. When we finally arrive at the sanctuary, we find its facade adorned for whatever ceremony is planned to take place. Moving in to take a closer look, we encounter a rather strange sight. We find the Count and Countess standing before a brazier, surrounded by women and children, dressed in red robes, and wearing creepy, emotionless masks. Today is the summer solstice, the longest day of the year, and they've come to the sanctuary to wake the child from its slumber with the flame of the phoenix. Huh. The trio slip into a nearby tent and put on the robes and masks before joining the procession as they're just about to enter the sanctuary. Amicia with Hugo, and Sophia with… some random child that just appears out of nowhere. Entering the sanctuary, we follow a long, richly adorned hallway, where we see the order symbol hanging from the ceiling, as well as on the frescoes that adorn the walls, suggesting that the sanctuary once belonged to them. At the very end is a large fresco of the child, below a blazing sun, all but confirming that connection between the order and this mysterious child of embers. Entering the next chamber, we find an all-too-familiar image. A mother and her child, infected with the Prima Macula. You may remember this very same fresco adorning Beatrice's secret laboratory in Innocence. 
Victor and Emily will then explain that the child, who had been born the child of fire and the source of Lacuna's prosperity, found evil within the halls of the sanctuary, weakening him, and marked his flesh with black scars. Thus he fell into darkness, his death, or long slumber as they call it, and the child of fire became the child of embers. The torch Emily is carrying is meant to represent the last of his light, the hope that the child will rise again and return to his mother and father. Now, a woman and child must carry the torch through the child's night, a la the darkness that dwells within him as he slumbers. Naturally, that means Amici and Hugo are chosen, because they have their heads bowed. They do this to avoid being recognized, but Emily sees this as a show of humility and hands the torch to Amicia, telling the siblings to push on through the rest of the sanctuary to know the cold that holds the child, with Victor referring to them as carriers. Oh, man. Entering the next hallway, which is filled with cold, fetid water, we find rather ominous frescoes on the walls, depicting the plague, one of which is the exact same fresco we find in the Roman ruins on the Darun estate, which you may recall is depicting Justinian's plague from the middle of the 6th century. But that's not all. At the very end, just before the waterfall, we find a fresco depicting the rats. Let's just stop for a second and think about this. Why would this sanctuary, clearly once belonging to the Order of Alchemists, have frescoes of a child, a phoenix, the bubonic plague, and the rats, and how does that all connect to the Child of Embers? Well, you see, the Child of Embers, as Amicia quickly and anxiously comes to realize here, was a carrier of the macula, just like Hugo. And the people of Lacuna, based on half-truths and based interpretations, have made a god out of him, with Victor and Emily as their prophets. Of course, this only answers who the Child of Embers really was, but what happened to the child, as well as where everyone and everything else fits into this wild origin story, remains a mystery. For those answers, we need to press on, through a freezing waterfall which puts out the torch we're carrying. With no other option, we press on. We begin down a dark hallway, with only distant voices of some choir to guide us. Beyond is another chamber, also dark, save for dim candles set along the path, joined by voices reciting some strange sermon. We're then greeted by Victor and Emily, shrouded in darkness, the latter of whom we hand the torch. They then light a large brazier, which reveals a large monument, again depicting the child and the phoenix. While Victor and Emily, along with their cultists, continue with the ritual, Sophia finds them and beckons that they follow her, having found a passage behind the monument. With that, we sneak away and move deeper into the sanctuary. Passing through another gate, the trio come upon a large courtyard, the literal heart of the sanctuary. At the back, shrouded in an alcove, is a small throne. Amicia quickly realizes that the carrier, the Child of Embers, lived in the sanctuary, where the Order could study him and perhaps come up with a solution to the Prima Macula. During this conversation, Amicia reveals more about the Macula and what it's doing to poor Hugo to Sophia, who seems to remain skeptical but goes with it nonetheless, a sign of the growing trust between them. However, when the subject of the rats arises, Amicia continues to remain tight-lipped. I doubt it takes a genius to figure out why. It's then that Amicia spots, on the back of the throne, some names. Basilius and Aelia. She shows this to Hugo, who spent the last few minutes sticking his hands in one of the pools of water in the courtyard. If you remember, there was a pond in Hugo's dream, the water of which cured him of the macula. This water clearly doesn't have healing magic, which, while disappointing to Hugo, isn't all that surprising. As Sophia's quick to point out, Stagnating water is rarely magic. It's then that Amicia shows Hugo the names on the back of the throne. Basilius was a carrier, just like Hugo, and most likely our enigmatic Child of Embers, though who Aelia is, is unclear. For that we need to continue searching, heading through a back door Sophia finds. The first room we find is a bedroom, full of toys and a tent, not too dissimilar to the one in Hugo's room back at the Darun estate. This bedroom of course belonged to Basilius, and we can take a moment to check it out if we wish. The next room over is another bedroom, one that belonged to a warrior, judging by the armor and weapons. But not just any warrior, for the armor bears a noticeably feminine shape. This would make this room belong to Aelia, who would have been Basilius' protector, just as Amicia is Hugo's. Like Basilius' room, we can explore Alias for a bit and learn that they, like Amici and Hugo, shared a strong bond, with there being a strong suggestion that they spent a lot of time together, though it's not clear if they were siblings as well. Leaving Alias room, we come upon a smaller courtyard and make a rather unfortunate discovery. We find yet another fresco of the Phoenix, but this time it's been superimposed by the Order's symbol. That's because, as Hugo is quick to realize, the Phoenix is the Order, and given its constant placement above the child in all the images and frescoes they share, they must have seen themselves as above the child, above Basilius. This upsets Hugo, for in his dream, the Phoenix was his guide to the healing pond, his helping hand, when in reality it represents the very Order that saw themselves as superior to the carrier and wanted to lock him away from the world. There's a marked shift in tone here, the happy-go-lucky feeling of the bedrooms giving way to trepidation, that we just might not want to know what else is hiding in this place. Amicia, however, wants to push on, so we make for another set of doors across the courtyard. 
Through the doors is another room where things become rather grim rather quickly. It's an alchemy laboratory with a table at its center, and on that table are restraints. I think we can all imagine what was happening here. With this room yielding nothing of substance, Sophia, who's gone on ahead, calls for us to meet her upstairs. Directly above the laboratory is a library, with grating set into the floor, directly above the table below, where Basilius could be observed by onlookers as he was being... tested on, we'll say. Sophia's found some manuscripts, and though they're written in Latin, she can translate some of them. There's nothing written about a cure, but the order kept extensive records of everything that happened to Basilius, with the last entry dated the year 541. Based on what Sophia can translate, the last entry states that Aelia was taken away from Basilius for some unknown reason. In response, she rebelled, and for this the Order locked her away in a chapel in some unnamed fort, while Basilius' whereabouts remain unknown. Nevertheless, it's something to go on, but before we can make our exit, we hear a door open out in the courtyard. Victor and Emily have arrived to perform some other ritual of their own, which involves standing in the stagnant water, which, let's be honest, is kinda gross. And yes, we're totally gonna ignore the fact that Hugo kinda did the same thing. With the Count and Countess present, we have to find an alternate means of getting out, and be discreet while doing so. We do this by going down a drain culvert, which, for some random reason, has an open pit with a grate midway along its path where dead animals have ended up, turning the water particularly nasty. Once outside, Amisa decides that they're going to go to the fort mentioned in the Order records. Hugo isn't all that keen on continuing the search for answers, however, saying that there wasn't a fort in his dream, though I think this is more him being disappointed that his dream isn't literal. I'd imagine by now you'll have already figured out that his dream is allegorical, as dreams often are, but Hugo's only 5 years old and won't understand this, and thus was always at a risk of being severely disappointed, and perhaps more, given that said dream pertains to finding a cure to his sickness that's literally killing him and has framed his entire young life. Thus, with this context, and viewing it through the lenses of his 5-year-old perspective, it's more than reasonable to me that he wouldn't want to continue this search for answers, even if we, in conjunction with Amicia, and perhaps Sophia somewhat, want to do just that. Hugo is ultimately convinced after some insistence from Amicia and gentle prodding from Sophia, and the trio set off back down the mountain with a new goal on the horizon, buoyed by everything they've just learned, but with still many questions unanswered. Um, can we take these stinky clothes off now? Yes, we should. Once the trio is back down the mountain and changed back into their own clothes, we return to the open area from before, but we're once again free to explore at our own leisure. It's during this descent that we learn how it is that Sophia knows Latin. Her mother came from a wealthy family, who were none too pleased to find out that her father was a smuggler, so off she went to the convent to be cleansed of his sins. It's at this convent she learned Latin, before ultimately escaping and joining her father, eventually taking on the occupation of smuggler as well. As just mentioned, we're free to explore this area once again before we proceed to the next linear section. We can even go back to the large fresco map where the trio can get their bearings before setting off. That said, in all my playthroughs, I haven't ever explored this area thoroughly during this second foray, so I can't say how much or what exactly is definitively changed for the whole area in conjunction with the passage of time. For example, the terrace in front of the palace or the cluster of homesteads directly in front of that. What has definitely changed is the festival area. You may remember from the last chapter the decorated tree where one of the cultists' strange rituals was taking place, with a feasting area being prepared nearby. Now, as we pass by, we can see that this feast is well and truly underway, flowered adorned archways line the path to it. People are eating, drinking, dancing, playing music, and just generally having a good time, all while praising the child and the mother. While there's nothing we can interact with here, as far as I've been able to find, it serves well as a sort of juxtaposition. The revelry of the islanders, blissfully ignorant of the truth through no fault of their own, set against the lingering doubt and unease of Hugo, who continues to remain down about everything we just learned back at the sanctuary. He'll wonder aloud if the people would still be in a celebratory mood if they knew the truth, then wish he could be like them, the term ignorance is bliss being all too real at this very moment. Leaving the festival behind, we head up the hill back towards the windmills, next to which stands the crumbling remains of a tower which was mentioned alongside the chapel and fort in the Order Manuscripts. As we make our final approach to the tower, Sophia, in an attempt to cheer up Hugo, will ask that he charge the tower and claim it for her, though she also does this so she can have a word with Amicia without Hugo being in earshot, for she's starting to have concerns of her own. It's pretty clear by now that this search for answers is wearing on Hugo, becoming a burden that he's struggling to bear. Ever keen-eyed, this hasn't gone unnoticed by Sophia, who asks Amicia if she's sure about everything they're doing. 
Amicia, who in fairness hasn't been oblivious to Hugo's plight either, will answer that it's because of that burden that they're doing all this, searching for answers and hopefully a cure. But Sophia will keep digging and point that they're chasing ghosts, those of Basilius and Aelia, and that those ghosts, given what we've learned about them so far, is scaring Hugo. After Amicia sharply replies that they've been through hell to get this far, Sophia will then ask, does Hugo need more? As in, does he need to go through more emotional turmoil and suffering to reach whatever mysterious angle this road will lead us to? What if he doesn't like what we find at the end? What then? Would it still all be worth it? Now, she doesn't ask all these questions, but if we read between the lines, I can imagine that she probably wants to, and was perhaps prepared to, but given Amicia's sharp rebuttal about the ghosts they're chasing, she chooses not to push. It's here that Sophia properly takes the role that Lucas once filled, a friend and confidant that Amicia can turn to when she needs guidance or help taking a load off her shoulders, but also, as we've just seen, isn't afraid to confront her when needed. Rejoining Hugo at the tower and making our way up to the highest floor, we catch sight of the fort further down the coast, dominating a small peninsula. With their minds set and a clear goal in mind, the trio head out for the fort. We then jump forward to them climbing down to the shore. We begin to follow the shoreline, treading along a path that eventually takes us right down to the beach, which offers an exceptional view, highlighting for me at least just how good this game looks. We even get a scenic view of the fort across the bay. Unfortunately, this fleeting moment of tranquility is brought to a swift end shortly after this when we catch sight of some blood, followed by this. Buddy. What? He's chained up. Hugo, understandably, wants to turn around and go back, but Amicia insists on continuing on. Things get even worse when, a little further up the beach, at a small gorge, we hear voices followed by a dead body landing directly in our path. The fort and its surroundings are clearly occupied and the current denizens appear to be far from friendly. As we begin to sneak through, we'll catch sight of the man who threw the other down the gorge before coming upon some ruins, where we see more armed men. Sophia here is quick to point out, based on what we've just seen and are currently seeing, that we seem to have run into slavers and have stumbled upon their base of operations. To get to the fort, we have to go through these ruins, a gauntlet that's split into two segments, this division marked by a flight of stairs and a crumbling tower, and begins with Amicia accidentally falling through to a sub-level where we kill one of the slavers via cruel but arguably more than deserved means after he tries to choke her. It's not until we reach the second and more substantial part of this section that we begin to learn some about what's going on. The first man we saw coming out of the gorge, named Milo, is the bastard-in-chief of the whole operation, and is apparently planning to take down the Count for some unknown reason. However, the means by which he plans to do this, which remains a mystery as of now, is beginning to frighten some of his lackeys, who, despite being paid well enough, feel that he's meddling with something that no one can control. We won't have to wait long to find out what that something is, for after we get through this section, we catch up to Milo at another set of ruins where he has some slaves tied up to posts. As he's doing this, one of his men, named Diaz, will begin to complain, then list his grievances when confronted by Milo. As Diaz puts it, rats are coming out of the ground, no doubt drawn in by the corpses the slavers are leaving behind, and are, as one might expect, eating the slavers themselves, which in turn is allowing some of their slaves to escape. In spite of this, Milo is continuing to waste what remains on the Countess. What that last point means is revealed when Milo rebukes Diaz. According to him, the rats herald the coming of the Child of Embers, and so Milo's been sacrificing slaves and feeding them to the rats, on the assumption that by pleasing the rats, they please the child, and thus will earn themselves a spot beside his throne when he finally arrives. Milo, as of right now, is doing this for himself and his loyal crew, in the hopes of first subduing the Count, then the rest of the world, but it's strongly implied that he was sacrificing slaves to the rats for the Countess, for Emily, for the exact same reason. Please the rats, please the child, earn a golden ticket to be at his side. This is really interesting to me, for if this is the case, because again it's only strongly implied, not directly stated, then it flips the script on our preconceived notions about how much the Count and Countess truly know about the true nature of their Child of Embers. It's suggested during our foray into the Sanctuary and just before we begin for the Fort that neither of them had dug into the Order's writings prior and thus would have only had the frescoes showing the rats as a reference, which isn't much to go on if you don't already have prior knowledge at your disposal. How would they know that the rats and the child are connected, beyond that one fresco behind the throne in the Sanctuary? How are they to know, with that alone, of the perceived symbiotic relationship between their child and the rats? Did they make a wild guess, or did they actually dig into the Order records? It's a really interesting thought, one that I would have loved to have seen explored in more depth, but sadly it isn't, though to be fair, it's not along the same lines as why Arnaud was looking for Vaudin, or the untouched bodies at the Darun estate back in Innocence, thanks in part to how events shake out later in the story, where the questions we've just asked are seemingly answered, at least in part. 
Diaz isn't down with what Milo is selling, and in response, Milo, being the reasonable man that he is, dashes Diaz's head against the very pillar the trio are hiding behind, which does make me wonder how he didn't see them, but we'll just ignore that. He then orders the slaves be executed, stating that their blood will show the child the way to the chapel before sauntering off. Hugo wants to help the slaves, despite the fact that they're already dead, and before Amicia realizes what he's doing, he conjures the rats and kills the slavers. Amicia gets rather upset with Hugo, telling him he can't just kill people like that, to which Hugo will retort that Amicia does it all the time, which is a very fair point that we'll come back to later, before running in the direction of some ruins. Meanwhile, poor Sophia can only look on in horror at what Hugo's just done. Remember, Amicia had made a concerted effort to keep from her that Hugo can just summon rats at will and get them to eat people. Well, now she knows, in quite possibly the worst way imaginable. As one might expect, she's none too pleased about this and confronts Amicia on the matter, and it's from the subsequent conversation that we get a slight glimpse into a part of Amicia's current state of mind. Amicia's reason for being silent on Hugo's connection to the rats is twofold. On the one hand, there's the obvious reason in that it's goddamn terrifying. Terrifying enough that Sophia might just run away at the first opportunity, and I think we can all agree that she'd be justified in doing so. That last point feeds into the second, more personal reason why Amicia kept the full truth from Sophia, which she reveals here while fighting back tears. That she was worried, maybe even scared, that Sophia would run away, and that she didn't want her to. Lacuna was meant to be a second chance for the siblings, to leave behind the horrors of the continent and begin anew, where friends like Sophia wouldn't need to see them like they are now. Yet it just so happens that Lacuna is full of horrible people doing horrible things, and as a result, the Daroons are forced to do horrible things themselves, intentional or otherwise. Amicia, at the very least, recognizes that she was wrong to keep the truth from Sophia, but I think this all goes to show that she's desperate enough for some amount of peace and normalcy that she's willing to withhold vital information just to maintain whatever slivers of it she can grasp onto, at the risk of it all blowing back in her face should that facade crumble. I do wonder what would have happened if she had told Sophia the whole truth up front. Would Sophia actually leave? I don't think so, since her joining the Daroons was initially built upon the idea that she owed Amicia for saving her life, and that she would pay it back by helping in their quest to save Hugo. Of course, this is all speculation, because Sophia ends up staying with them right to the very end anyways. She does, however, need some time to comprehend what she just saw, and does this while Amicia goes and talks to Hugo, who remains upset over the actions of the slavers, as well as how things have gone in general. After both siblings apologize to Sophia, we continue to press on towards the fort, passing through some ruins, which includes an off-shooting area where we can find a tree with a chain tied to it. And a child's toy. I don't think I need to explain what happened here. Once we pass through the ruins, we catch sight of the fort. Before we can get there, we have to cross the ruins of a village, with slavers crawling everywhere, and the bodies of slaves hung like grisly Christmas decorations, which follow the road leading to the fort. If you remember, Milo stated earlier that the blood would show the child the way to the chapel. Despite the heinous depravity of it all, it would suggest that there may be something there, and not just the mad ravings of a deranged slaver. From here, we methodically make our way to the fort, avoiding or killing the slavers as we go, though I'd wager, given some of the things you can find in this area, you'd just be like me and hard-pressed not to give them what they deserve and kill them all outright. We eventually reach the main gate, which is shut to us, and Hugo will once again reiterate a desire to turn around and leave, this time with support from Sophia, though Amicia makes clear that they need to continue, reasoning that this mess means something. We make it inside the fort by way of an opening in the wall, which takes us to a staircase that leads up to the gatehouse, where a slaver ambushes Amicia and begins to choke her, until Sophia, in a role-reversed repeat of the fishing village, saves her by taking his knife and stabbing him to death. From here, we head down another flight of stairs where we find a wagon, full of dead bodies, possibly more sacrifices for Milo. Sophia leaves the Daroons to raise the poor Cullis, while the siblings hide in the cart as it rolls into the fort. It's then that Hugo senses the rats approach. Sure enough, a giant swarm of rats burst through a crumbling section of the fort walls, killing the soldiers and slaves around the cart, while the rest of the slavers, on Milo's order, light up a trench to keep the vermin at bay, while he scurries off to the chapel. Things are looking downright grim, the nearest light source too far away for Amicia and Hugo to reach safely. It's then that Sophia returns and, on a leap of faith, uses her prism to channel the light of the fire to create a circle of light around her, which is enough to keep the rats at bay, which she then uses to reach the wagon and rescue the siblings. From here, we begin to make our way to the chapel, carefully navigating the rats, making ample use of Sophia's prism, along with handling more slavers guarding the way. After raising another poor Cullis, we finally reach the chapel and bear witness to Milo's savagery, having had slaves sacrificed and hung from columns lining the approach to the chapel in brutal, ritualistic fashion. At this, Hugo makes a telling comment. He would kill them for this. Heading inside the chapel, the door of which is adorned with the order's symbol, we find a fresco above an altar, depicting the carrier on his throne and rats at his feet. 
Standing beside him is the Protector, though not Alias specifically, the chapel being dedicated to the position, not the person filling it. On either side of the carrier and the Protector are men in robes, seemingly bowing to the child. At first glance they may just appear to be renditions of the Magisters of the Order, but after giving it some thought I'd argue they could very well be worshipping the carrier. The medieval ages were a highly religious and superstitious period of history. With war, famine, and apocalyptic disease running rampant, it only made sense for people to turn to the divine in search of answers and salvation when the mortal governing authorities failed them. Given that the carrier possesses literal godlike powers, if they reach the right threshold for it, it only makes sense that people would turn to worshipping them as a deity if only in the hopes of placating a god that's capable of conjuring disease-bearing rats at will. On top of this, all the frescoes we find are done with a degree of religious panache and posturing, akin to what you might find in an orthodox church or the like, which would suggest, from the outset, that the carrier was, at least in the 6th century, regarded with some amount of divinity. I doubt they'd have gone to such pains making them appear as such otherwise. As it pertains to Basili specifically, there isn't much evidence beyond mere conjecture, though there is a small amount that can be gleaned from an otherwise inconsequential conversation that can be overheard in Innocence, during when we control Hugo in the Inquisition Bastion. During this section, we come across two alchemists discussing a text that, according to one of them, clearly states the ascension of a child during the Justinian Plague, and that said child was isolated and worshipped by Roman nobles in secret. While there's no such direct mention of worship anywhere in Requiem, if we take that line in context with the road men in the fresco in the chapel, as well as what we saw in the sanctuary with regards to the throne, then I don't think it's too far-fetched of a notion to believe that there would be some among the order who viewed Basilius as something near to a god. Heading down to the chapel's sublevel, we find a crypt that's been turned into a sort of prison. At the back is another altar with chains, presumably where Ailey was kept. Nearby is a flagstone with an engraved message, written in Latin. Unum tueri honest tuendo. Protect one, protect all. Pulling up the flagstone, we again find the order symbol, where Amicia will begin to connect the dots. If you remember from the map, the three points of the order symbol are used to denote specific locations. The palace, the sanctuary, and the fort. All three of these locations are then connected to a central point, the map itself. It's there that Amicia deduces where Basilius was taken, denoted by a ring she finds on that exact spot on the dirt etching, one that presumably belonged to Aelia before. It would seem that Aelia, even 800 years later, is guiding them along, a protector's legacy to another protector. With this, we can now leave the fort and head back to the map, but as we leave the chapel, Milo reappears and ambushes us. Milo then sees Hugo, recognizes him as the child, and submits himself before him. As he does this, Sophia attacks him and the two begin to tussle, which ends with her taking his knife and stabbing him to death. Before we even have a chance to catch our breath, slavers appear, forcing Amicia to take them on, while Sophia protects Hugo and looks for a means to escape. As more slavers enter the courtyard to take down Amicia, Hugo will become more and more agitated and begin begging to help his sister, who in turn tells him to stay down, fearful that Hugo may not be able to control himself for much longer. Alas, this fear soon comes to fruition, for Hugo will leave Sophia's side and conjure a horde of rats, slaughtering the rest of the slavers and collapsing whole sections of the fort, while Amicia desperately gets him to stop. It's then that Sophia finds an exit, one that I must stress was there the whole time and probably could have maybe been used earlier? Possibly, which leads to a small dock and boat. From here the trio make a hasty exit, leaving the fort to the rats. We cut to them out at sea, Sophia rowing, while the Darun sit in silence, shaken by what's just happened. Hugo will then burst into tears, lamenting how the island, the one of his dreams, was supposed to help, but instead things have only gotten worse. As Amicia moves to comfort her brother, Sophia will stop rowing and ask Hugo, rather sternly, to look her in the eyes and ask why he's crying, to which Hugo answers that it's because he believes she'll leave, because of him. This is the point where Sophia, just like Lucas did with Amicia when they were imprisoned, reflects on and confronts the siblings' actions, both at their lowest points. A harsh but necessary action, especially when it could be argued that the scene at the chapel could have been avoided. Sophia asserts that she has no intention of leaving them, for despite what she's seen, she's grown to like them, even at their absolute worst. That said, things have to change. Hugo, for starters, needs to calm down and listen to the adults. Twice now he's gone ahead and conjured rats without so much as an inkling of permission, letting his anger and frustration dictate his actions in a destructive way. Sophia then turns her fire on Amicia, forcefully reminding her that she's not a one-woman army, running around and killing people at will. Hugo looks up to her, and part of what has driven him to act out as he has is because of Amicia's actions. If she can do it, why can't he? When unchecked, these actions coalesce into what we've just seen. Death and destruction, something that cannot continue if they're ever to succeed. Things must change. 
From here, Sophia rows the boat back to shore, while the Daroons, safe with the knowledge that she won't leave, sit in silence, perhaps dwelling on what's to come, as night slowly begins to fall over Lacuna. Unfortunately, this isn't the end of our immediate troubles, quite the opposite in fact. As we pass through the same gate we went through to get to the crumbling tower from before, we can see that the rats have all but enveloped the island. It's a stark and dramatic change from before, the colorful tranquility of the land, accentuated by the festive atmosphere, waylaid by the grim darkness of night and the rats that came with it, the latter brought on by Hugo's actions back at the fort. Thankfully, the path leading to where the festival was taking place is lined with lit torch staffs, which Sophia can use for her prism to channel the light, allowing us to safely pass where the light doesn't reach. Reaching the festival area, we find some people, clustered around a torch staff. Before we can help them, however, more rats burst from underground and kill them, which greatly upsets Hugo, his young mind heavily burdened with guilt. With little option, they press on, using a brazier on a wagon to navigate the once vibrant festival grounds. Past the festival grounds, we follow the road back to the palace, lined with more torch staffs and haystacks that we can set on fire. Using these, we finally reach the safety of the path back to the map, situated on high ground. Reaching the map itself, it doesn't take long for the trio to realize that the path to Basilius is underground somewhere, probably right where the map is. Pushing a broken column onto it from above reveals just that. A passage, one that leads deeper underground. But why seal it up? What were they trying to lock away? Amicia is quick to jump down and begin searching, but Hugo is hesitant, saying that it's too dark, though I doubt that's the only reason. It may not be apparent just yet, but this entryway serves as a sort of precipice. The big question being, what will they find? Given that Hugo, who at almost every turn has been correct in his gut assumptions that evil is near, doesn't want to go down into the depths of whatever lies beneath the map, this says to me that he can sense that something is amiss, and not just the darkness. It's at this point that Sophia intervenes once again and convinces Hugo to jump down, while she follows right behind him. From here we begin to make our way down the passage, buoyed by the fresh prospect of finally getting some definitive answers, tempered by the trepidation of what those answers may reveal, as we descend deeper into the darkness. Once we're through the broken opening, we begin to work our way down a vaulted staircase, cut straight from the rock, with only the light of the moon bursting through natural shafts above giving us any sort of light. At the base of the steps, the path leads to another chamber, shrouded completely in darkness. Before we go in, we use Ignifer to light a brazier. Suddenly, a thin line of light races from the brazier, until… What the hell? Revealed to us is a massive underground temple, left undisturbed by the outside world for nearly 800 years, until now. Further along, we find the Order's symbol yet again, strongly suggesting that this was indeed where Basilius was taken. We also find empty copper tanks, once full of a mysterious liquid, now empty. Beyond this initial area is a set of doors, blown open from the outside, the remains of those same tanks littered around the vicinity. Further beyond, down a passage, are the remains of another explosion, collapsing the wall and destroying another gate which has been filled in with rubble. Amicia quickly realizes these explosions were alias handiwork, that she had escaped the chapel and was trying to get Basilius back, and that they're currently following her trail. With the original way blocked, we're forced to take a detour, one that takes us to another area of the temple where we see the remains of a landslide, no doubt caused by Aelia's explosions, signs of just how desperate she was to get to Basilius. In this same chamber is a stuck gate. After a brief investigation, Sophia discovers that the barrels we've been finding all over the place once held Greek fire, an incendiary weapon that was developed by the Eastern Romans and one whose composition was a closely guarded state secret. So secret, in fact, that to this day, no one truly knows how it was made. Sophia suspects that the Order merely used it to keep the lights on, but given that Aelia was using it to blast her way through the temple, she posits that, while in the tanks, the highly flammable liquid could become explosive. Surprise, surprise, there just so happens to be a tank in this chamber, still sealed and full of Greek fire. Sophia sets the tank down in front of the gate, and Amicia, after everyone's taking cover, shoots an ignifer at the tank which, as predicted, explodes and destroys the gate, allowing them passage. If I have one minor quibble here, it's that Greek fire as we know it wasn't first developed until 672, 130 years after Aelia's rescue attempt. That being said, it's entirely plausible that the Order developed some form of the stuff for themselves well before then, and only ever intended to use it to keep the lights on, where Aelia discovered its explosive capabilities. After passing through the next chamber, and using more Greek fire to blast a way through, we find ourselves back on Aelia's trail, along with the grim discovery of armor-clad skeletons, the remains of Order guards who attempted to stop Aelia. 
After we use a wagon loaded with Greek fire to destroy another gate, Sophia makes a rather interesting comparison between Amicia and Aelia. I think, you know, I'm starting to see her in you. Aelia. Because I'm as desperate as her? Because you don't let go. <sighs> well. I think by now it's pretty clear to all of us that this journey, this quest that Amicia has set her mind to, isn't just about Hugo anymore. It's become much, much more than that. This is evidenced at multiple points, particularly in and around the fort, when Hugo expresses a reluctance to continue, even supported by Sophia at one point, but Amicia won't hear it. They have to push on, they have to find answers, anything that might cure Hugo and free him of the macula's grasp. This is in spite of when Hugo, back on the Raskast, just after they first sighted Lacuna, says rather bluntly that it doesn't matter if he dies. You recall that Amicia nearly has a panic attack at this, and I strongly believe that it's at this moment when Amicia's focus dramatically evolves. Saving Hugo is still the ultimate goal. That hasn't changed, nor will it ever, but it's now heavily laden with her slowly building desperation to save him before he succumbs. A desperation fueled by a single particular fear. The fear of being alone. Hugo has been the one true constant she's had in her life since everything began, way back at the beginning of Innocence, which in turn has led to the forming of a bond that few, if anyone, could truly hope to understand, forged by the many trials and tribulations they've been forced to endure to get to where they are. With everything and everyone else around her having either left her, been taken from her, discarded by necessity, or perhaps on the edge of walking away, Amicia is petrified at the thought of losing the one person who has remained by her side through it all, and is unwilling to accept that Hugo may very well die, unwilling to let go. It's this fear that has driven her actions since we landed on Lacuna, which have steadily become more drastic and desperate. All the while, the very boy she's sworn to find a cure for, her own little brother, doesn't even want to continue, given that everything he had hoped for has more or less gone to shit. Yet Amicia marches ever forward. As mentioned before, she isn't oblivious to Hugo's plight, but she can't stop, because the need to cure Hugo, and the fear of being alone if she doesn't, have become so intertwined with one another that, in her mind, they're no longer mutually exclusive. I can't say one way or the other if Amicia is subconsciously aware of this. My guess would be both. She's aware to a certain degree, but has been pushing it to the back of her mind so that it doesn't supersede that which is the ultimate crux of this entire endeavor, saving Hugo. All the while, it continues to fester and grow, subtly feeding her growing desperation, with further fuel being thrown onto the fire as they discover more about Basilius and Aelia, and follow their ghosts around Lacuna. There are occasional moments where this breaks, such as when we push the brazier wagon through the festival area on the way to the map, and we get a brief glimpse into this dual mindset going on in Amicia's head. Yourselves, you For now it's limited to a certain degree, and it won't fully break open until nearer towards the end of the story, but this comment by Sophia, who is shown to have a keen understanding of people and their motivations, makes it clear that it hasn't gone unnoticed by her, and perhaps shouldn't go unnoticed by you. After we destroy the last gate, we make a remarkable discovery. An enormous chamber, one that frankly defies description. Directly beyond is a sort of courtyard slash platform, with braziers, some of which are on carts on rails, connected to a bridge that leads to a gate on the far side of the chamber. And of course it's then that more rats appear. Acting quickly, we light the central brazier, which also lights up the rails and the braziers on the carts. Amici quickly realizes that it's another elaborate defense system to keep the rats at bay, just like at the Chateau d'Ambrage. Using the carts, we carefully navigate around the courtyard slash platform, I don't know what else to call it, to get to the bridge, with a few offshooting areas we can explore. These areas mostly only have resources, but one in particular yields some rather interesting information. There's a ledge that, if you're willing to dare the rats, you can jump down and look around. There's the as expected chest of crafting supplies, but there's also a makeshift table nearby with building plans and maps. Investigating it, we can see plans for both this very chamber we're in, showing the placement of rails and mechanisms, as well as the aforementioned Chateau d'Ambrage. Next to those is a map, showing the locations of similar sites alongside these. Constantinople, Denmark, Africa, even as far as Asia, though we don't get a precise location for the last two. It's a very interesting find. For much of the series, particularly in Requiem, the assumption had always been that the order was mostly European-based, with the African location most likely being Alexandria in Egypt, which was a center of intellectual and cultural learning in the 6th century and under Eastern Roman rule in 541. Yet it's the discovery of a possible location in Asia that reveals the true reach of the order. This could just be for the simple fact that, as Hugo points out, a plague like the Black Death or the Plague of Justinian can happen anywhere. As discussed in the last video, it's hypothesized that the origins of the Black Death may be rooted in Asia. The more far-reaching implication, however, given the Order's obsession with it, could be that the Prima Macula itself has been known to appear elsewhere in the world, 
not just Europe. Given that it's believed to have existed since the dawn of mankind, could it be that the macula, and by extension a carrier, emerged at one point or another somewhere in Asia? It's a really interesting thought, and one that I hope gets explored more in the future, because I find it rather compelling. While most study in Western historiography regarding bubonic plagues is focused on its effects in Europe, there are extensive records of bubonic outbreaks across China, and could be an interesting setting for a future title in the series. Please, Asobo, please. Once we've successfully navigated the courtyard slash platform, I still don't know what to call it, we find ourselves on the bridge that will take us to the other side of the chamber, which, luckily for us, is bathed in what I presume to be moonlight. Though it appears to be way too bright to be that, so maybe it's sunlight, but that would seriously muck with the passage of time. Oh hell, I don't know. Moving on. Yes! On the bridge, we find yet more skeletons of order guards, viciously cut down by Aelia, further building on the image of her being a fierce fighter, desperate to get to Basilius. Hugo will then remark that Aelia knew something bad was happening to him. Amisa will ask what was being done to him, but he only answered that he feels dark, like he did in his dream when he was dying. While it's not entirely surprising that the order was being less than caring stewards, this would suggest something far darker was being done to Basilius than what we saw at the sanctuary. Once across the bridge and through the gate, we enter another chamber, with a massive set of locked doors on the far side. In the center of the chamber, we find a single skeleton, surrounded by scores of others. The final resting place of Aelia. While Sophia takes Hugo's hand and heads to check out the door, Amicia takes a moment and kneels next to Aelia, and we see another break wherein her fear of being alone comes to the fore, further amplified by the reveal that Aelia suffered such a fate. Meanwhile, Hugo, while checking out the door with Sophia, again suggests that they turn back. It's then that Amicia joins them once more and reassures him, which appears to be enough for Hugo, for now at least. Now we just need to get through the doors. To do that we need to pull on levers and hold them in place, for pulling them slides back the bars keeping them closed. Doing this raises a wheel from the floor, which, once all the way up, Amicia and Sophia spin to open the way forward. Beyond is another corridor, shrouded in darkness. We light a nearby brazier, which sends a stream of light down the length of the corridor, illuminating it. As we begin to make our way forward, we soon realize that we've opened a gateway into hell. <sighs> oh, oh, what are we breathing? The walls just past the brazier are covered with the ghastly matter of a giant rat's nest, emitting clouds of the sickly black shit that poisons the air around them. Here though, it's noticeably thicker than usual, and Hugo will point out that it's been here a long time, possibly since the time of Basilius. At the end of the corridor is another large chamber, the floor of which is weighed down below the one we're on, with a series of massive chains extending beyond the ledge and hanging from the ceiling. Breaking a chain holding a nearby lever allows the chains to rise up, bringing with them interconnected panels that form a bridge to the other side. Unfortunately, not all the panels have been raised. To figure out why, we'll need to descend to the bottom of the chamber, which has been completely overrun by the rat's nest, the very same one we first encountered in the corridor beforehand. Getting down there is no simple task, the only means being a steep portion of the nest itself. Amicia goes first and pretty much eats shit at the bottom. Disturbed by the commotion, rats burst from the nest, forcing us to make a mad dash to a ladder that takes us onto a ledge, while Sophie and Hugo remain on the bridge. It's on the ledge that we see how the bridge panels are raised and lowered, the chains having counterweights attached at their opposite ends. Two of the bridge panels are stuck, though fixing them is rather simple. The mechanisms meant to control the counterweights are stuck, so all we need to do is help them along by breaking the middle chain, thus allowing the counterweights to drop and, coincidentally, allowing us in and out of the side gallery along the chamber walls. The hard part is getting from the first mechanism to the second. Direct access via the gallery has been blocked by the nest and god knows what else, so we have to jump back down onto the floor of the chamber and navigate the vermin's home turf. Meanwhile, Hugo and Sophia will watch Amicia's progress from above, and we can hear Hugo grow more and more anxious as we progress, though Sophia is quick to reassure him, which doesn't go unnoticed by Amicia. Eventually we raise the last panel. Now we just need to get back to the others. For that we'll need to cross the nest to reach a ladder on the other side, using a brazier on a wagon that just so happens to be there, while getting some assistance from Hugo and Sophia in clearing an obstruction with a barrel of Greek fire. Sophia and Hugo will be waiting for Amicia at the top, the latter hugging her, sobbing while he does it, having been scared for her the whole time she was down there. Back in the chamber where we found Aelia, Hugo will become frightened at the prospect of Amicia dying. Lo and behold, here we are, Amicia brushing with death at the hands of the rats, all alone in the dark abyss of the chamber. It's an almost perfect mirroring of Amicia's fear of losing Hugo, reflecting back the other way around, which might suggest that Hugo may be aware of this fear Amicia is harboring. At the end of the bridge is another corridor, the walls covered with more of the nest, the air thick with the pungent black stuff it gives off, and without a light source, be it a brazier or torch, in sight, save for a white light at the end. As we traverse the corridor, Hugo will start to become anxious, more than he's ever been before this point, and when Amicia asks what's wrong, he'll say that it is there, very close, that which they've come all this way for. 
He immediately wants to turn back, but Amicia once again insists that they must continue. As one might expect, things only get worse once we're through the corridor. Beyond is a cylindrical chamber, a well of sorts, one that leads further down via a staircase wrapped around its exterior. Likened by Amicia to a cathedral, it's been entirely consumed by the rats in their nest. Hugo will remark that they built it for him, for Basilius, though whether he's referring to the actual structure built by the Order, or the way the rats have built their nests is unclear. Either way, what's now clear to us is that Basilius is here, at the bottom of the well, the heart of everything. Amicia will then come to the starkly grim realization that what happened here looks like what the last threshold would do. Aelia, despite her best efforts, failed to reach Basilius, and this is what happened. But what of Basilius himself? For that we need to head down the stairs to the bottom. Hugo wants nothing to do with this, and rightly so, but Amicia says they must, reasoning that Basilius, 800 years later, brought him here, going so far as to call it his legacy, which, if I may be brutally honest, is really, really stupid on Amicia's part, given how agitated and anxious Hugo is. Going down to the bottom of the well is an almost torturous experience, the staircase feeling like it's going on forever, each step feeling like a descent into hell itself. As we descend, we'll start to see strange, writhing sacks on the inner walls of the well, though what they are remains a mystery, for now anyways. Hugo will continue to grow more agitated, lamenting how he's ruined everything, while Amicia pleads that he continues on, to trust her. All the while, the voice inside his head, that of Basilius, grows louder and louder. Eventually, Hugo will come to a complete stop, refusing to go on, demanding to know why she's doing this to him, with even Sophia voicing her own misgivings. Amicia will then pick him up and carry him the rest of the way, while she promises Hugo that he will have a future, even if they must fight for it. Soon after this, we reach the bottom. Taking each other's hands, the siblings round a final corner, and find Basilius. The Order didn't just put him here. They imprisoned him, chained him up like an animal, so scared they were of his power, though it clearly wasn't enough to stop the macula once it consumed the poor child, who remains where he was left 800 years later, cocooned by the macula in the final death throes of his suffering. Amicia will then come to another grim realization. If you remember, the last written record of the Order Manuscript, the one that set us on this harrowing journey, was dated in 541, the same year the Justinian Plague began. Putting two and two together, Amicia realizes that it was here, with Basilius succumbing to the macula in the final threshold that the Justinian Plague was unleashed upon the world. Amicia then anxiously realizes that their being here was all a setup, an elaborate ruse concocted by the macula to draw Hugo in and repeat what happened to Basilius, beginning with his dream, a false message of hope and salvation, one that has only led to more suffering and torment. Amicia will frantically look for a cure, or a scroll that may divine one, but finds nothing, for there's ultimately none to be had. From this she'll come to another realization. Alias' failed attempt to reach Basilius wasn't just so that she wouldn't be alone, but so that he would know that he wasn't alone, for it was them being separated from one another that pushed him over the edge. So here we are, a few hours into the second video of this series, and we're only just beginning to talk about the power of emotion and how it tangibly connects to the macula and its power. Though in my defense, despite it being brought up a few times across the series up to this point, it's only now that it's brought into sharp and deliberate focus. As we learned from Lucas back in Innocence, the prima macula evolves with its host, but not in the same way as most living organisms do. Despite the power it carries and bestows upon the carrier, it can't evolve on its own. It's entirely dependent on the carrier feeding it what it needs to do so. What it feeds on is the grief and rage of the carrier, powerful emotions that, even without the presence of an entity like the macula, can cause terrible and tangible change, which can often lead to disastrous consequences if enough power from these emotions is focused enough. As it concerns the carrier, the macula amplifies this by a million, for, as we just mentioned, without them, it can't grow, it can't evolve. It's how Hugo reached the first threshold in innocence, the macula feeding on the anger he felt for Amicia lying to him about their mother. It's also how he would have passed the second threshold whenever that happened. Now, as the trio bear witness to the devastation of the final threshold, the macula plays its final hand, one that it's been building to for some time, starting with Hugo's dream, the lure it conjured to bring him to Lacuna, as well as the nightmares that put him into seizures, where he lost control and the rats laid waste to the Red City. Once on Lacuna, the macula patiently waited for the trio to follow the trail of Basilius and Aelia, one that has only led to more pain and suffering, allowing for the grief and rage to build within Hugo, which hasn't been helped either by Amicia's actions, before reaching its final crescendo with the discovery of Basilius and his fate. As we see with Basilius, once the carrier gives in to the final threshold, the macula releases all of the built-up grief and rage in the form of a devastating plague, condemning millions to death in the process, carried out by millions of rats, the harbingers of the macula's wrath, the carrier's final judgment on the world for failing them. 
Basilius gave in to the final threshold after he lost hope, believing that he was alone, that Aelia was perhaps dead, and thus allowed the Macula to consume him and unleash the Justinian Plague. Yet from this tragic and horrifying end, in a strange and, dare I call it, ironic twist of fate, we find the answer we need to save Hugo. Amicia realizes that if Aelia had managed to get word to Basilius that she was alive and that he wasn't alone, he might not have given in to the Macula and thus would have spared the world the horrors of the Justinian Plague. By this logic, Amicia reckons that, if they were to find a home, far away from all the suffering they've endured and find the peace they've so desperately sought, the Macula would become dormant, just as it did during the six months of respite between Innocence and Requiem, for the grief and rage in Hugo will have subsided and it will have nothing to feed on. Amicia relays this last part to Hugo as he stares at Basilius. At first it falls on deaf ears, Hugo enraged by the sight of Basilius, the poor child's face still twisted in agony from the moment he let the macula take him, while Hugo himself looks set to follow that same path. Thankfully, Amicia pulls him back from the brink, promising to give him the life he deserves, one without violence, disease, and death, to give him a home where they can finally be at peace. While this is happening, Sophia keeps a constant, anxious watch on the writhing sacks we've seen, scattered throughout the well. Turns out these sacks are full of rats, and are perhaps the means by which the macula produces them. Once Amicia has gotten through to Hugo and he calms down, the sacks suddenly and violently burst, releasing the rats within, perhaps in response to Amicia pulling Hugo back from what it wanted, for him to commit to the last threshold. So begins perhaps the most anxiety-inducing chase sequence in the entire game, as we flee up the well from the torrent of rats, who spill in from outside the well and progressively fill up the well as well, a rising tide of vermin dead set on keeping Hugo down there. Sophia runs ahead of us, giving us a trail to follow, one that detours away from the well and through a myriad of side corridors and progressively goes up and up, though with the rats on our heels almost from the outset, any hang up or slowdown could be fatal, so you must be quick with the button prompts upon reaching ledges or narrow gaps. We eventually make it back to the bridge with the panels, which the rats destroy as they continue to pursue. Once we're across, we find an opening in the wall that leads to a tunnel, with a shaft of light beyond. Our way out. As we make it outside, the tunnel collapses behind us, sealing the rats inside, and we can finally breathe. Hugo will begin to lament what he saw, scared by the thought that people are bad enough to chain up a child and leave them to rot and what they might make him do, but is reassured by both Amicia and Sophia, and the trio turn and leave the temple come prison behind. From there we catch a glimpse of the palace, only to find that things haven't gotten any better. Quite the opposite, in fact. The rats have taken over the island completely, while the Count's soldiers have set up defenses around the palace in the form of torches, braziers, and bonfires. Of course, we know, and as Amicia points out, it's all fruitless. Others have done the same thing before, and still died anyways. Not that it matters to them anymore, for they now plan to leave Lacuna, with Hugo's presence on the island, given the power of the Macula wields here, being a threat to everyone. Following a path that cuts through the hills, we eventually reach the main road that leads to the palace. Just as we're about to leave, we're spotted by a soldier, who informs them that they have orders to escort the siblings to the safety of the palace, adding that, when Amici politely declines, they have guests. Their mother, and a boy. Turns out Beatrice and Lucas have managed to track them to Lacuna, which, if I'm honest, I'm having a hard time believing to be possible, at least within the given amount of time we've covered since Amici and Hugo left Beatrice and Lucas behind. More on that in a bit, as for now, Amicia acquiesces with the soldier's request, though only after some gentle nudging from Hugo, followed by her realizing that they can't run away from them forever, even if it means suffering a bollocking from Beatrice. Given that the invitation didn't include her, Sophia offers to head straight to the village harbor and prepare La Rascas for departure. Taking the torch Amicia offers her, she sets off, while the Daroons follow the soldier back to the palace for their unexpected reunion. Following the soldier to the palace, we see that the lands in front of it have been turned into a war zone, soldiers having set up barricades alongside the many fires to ward off the rats. They also have some strange turret, mounted on wagons, spitting long streams of fire, fueled by barrels of Greek fire. Where they got it, along with the barrels, is never revealed, though the most likely case is that they managed to secure some from the temple come prison via an alternate access, or there are more order ruins that had the stuff. In any event, they've managed so far to keep the rats away from the palace, whose gates Victor and Emily have opened to the people to take shelter. Things get more frantic the closer to the palace we get, with some villagers partaking in the defense efforts. They really should evacuate, but for whatever reason this hasn't been done, with the people instead being cloistered together within the palace walls. It's as if they've forgotten that the rats don't just eat people, but also spread the plague and oh look, 
All the wounded have been gathered in a courtyard turned into a makeshift infirmary, all the wounded having been bitten, with it now being just a matter of time before the plague spreads, with it being more likely now that the bite kills them before the rats do, assuming the defenses hold. Past the infirmary, inside the palace proper, are the rest of the villagers, those unharmed by the rats. There's a great deal of confusion among them, for the rats were meant to herald the coming of the child, but instead of bringing the brighter days like they had hoped, they brought death, destruction, and suffering. Some call it a test sent by the child, while others begin to openly question their faith in him, while others simply begin to pray. Pray that they make it through the night, and that the child will be merciful. These games are not shy about showing the human cost of catastrophes like the plague and, to lesser extents, war and slavery, and nor should they be. At the risk of sounding stupidly obvious, this was far from a pleasant time in history, and the games do an exceptional job at reflecting it, even if there are some liberties taken in service to the plot. I'd argue that they're intrinsic and necessary to the overarching narrative across both games, for the experience would be considerably lesser as a result if it didn't make a concerted effort to show it. We also wouldn't have had that constant tension we spoke about in the Innocence video, for a good amount of that tension relies on the visceral exposure to the human cost that was suffered at that time. It irks me to no end when people complain that these kinds of imagery or set pieces in video games make them feel uncomfortable, because that's exactly the goddamn point. You're not supposed to be okay with what you're seeing, and that's good. It's a perfectly valid emotional response to have towards scenes like this. Of course it doesn't feel good, but I'd argue that it makes you more aware of what's going on around you and how your actions, or that of others, have or had had consequences. By refusing to pull any punches in displaying this visceral, grotesque imagery in their environments and set pieces, these games remain grounded in their given setting, even as the overarching menace is a possibly supernatural entity that bestows godlike powers on its unwilling host. What makes this scene through the palace the most poignant for me when it comes to betraying the human cost is that it feels like we're being forced to bear witness. Despite what I just said before this, other moments like this can be ignored, if only just, and only if you have a high enough tolerance for these kinds of things. Here that isn't an option, as we're directly confronted by the sights and sounds of those suffering, as the palace is effectively put under siege by the rats, with everyone who made it to safety crammed inside. What gives it even more emotional weight is how it stands in stark contrast to how the island was when we first arrived, and in the case of Amici and Hugo personally, it's kind of their fault, or at least Hugo's fault, for the rats seemed quite content to remain underground until he conjured them in and around the fort, a fact that the siblings are not oblivious to. Eventually, we reach a set of doors, behind which we find Beatrice and Lucas. Despite their initial concerns, Beatrice is the opposite of angry, only thankful and relieved that her children are alive and well, despite the circumstances. Despite the momentousness of the occasion, I unfortunately have to be the nitpicky asshole that I am, because as mentioned at the end of the last chapter, I'm having a hard time believing that Beatrice and Lucas somehow just managed to track Amici and Hugo just like that in the amount of time that has passed since they initially separated. Beatrice will say that the siblings left quite a trail behind them, which, in all fairness, is very true, but that alone can't explain it. If that is indeed what they did, then they would have only gotten as far as the shores of the Mediterranean, and that's it. I severely doubt there just so happened to be a ship nearby that was heading to Lacuna. That would suggest to me that they went to Marseille, and not just to get a ship, but also to find out where Lacuna is. Remember, we didn't even get a name until Arnaud plucked the siblings out from the gorge and two whole days had passed. Beatrice and Lucas going to Marseille to ascertain Lacuna's location, as well as to find a ship heading there, is not a ridiculous notion. In fact, it's rather reasonable. My issue is that this has been presumed to have been done inside roughly five days. Let's not forget, they remained on the boat when Amici and Hugo went their own way, and who knows how long they remained on it before managing to get off, or where they even ended up. They could have easily ended up somewhere where getting to Marseille would have taken a good couple of days. I know this sounds like a weird thing to complain about, but it feels like Beatrice and Lucas managed to cover a considerable amount of ground in less than a week when it doesn't seem reasonably possible. Had this all happened in a week and a half to two weeks, then my only complaint would be the lack of a real explanation beyond that they followed the trail of bodies left in their wake, but at least we could fill in the blanks with our minds without needing to try and comprehend the strange leaps of faith in the passage of time. Amicia will explain to them about what they found, and what they need to do to help Hugo get better, using what happened to Basilius and how things were in the six months prior to the game's events as support for her argument. Beatrice concurs with Amicia, the sight of her staying in lockstep with the Order completely cast aside, and she'll even admit that she was wrong and that Amicia was right. So then suggest, in effect with Amicia's plan, that they head to a house in the mountains, where they can live in peace and isolation. It's not explicitly clear where this house is, though given the families originally from Aquitaine, my guess would be the Pyrenees, along the border of modern France and Spain. Things look to be set, but before they can leave, one of Victor's knights appear. The Count has requested Amicia's presence, though he doesn't say why. Amicia isn't all too keen, but Beatrice tells her it's fine, that they'll be safer in the palace anyways. With that said, Amicia follows after the knight. 
We find Victor consulting some of his officers. Presumably a veteran of the Hundred Years' War, the Count is very much in his element, treating the appearance of the rats very much like a war, which is in keeping with how we find the palace when we arrived earlier. Once he's finished, he'll ask Amicia to follow him. The two will chat along the way, where Victor will lament the end of the peace he had hoped would last after many years of war. After we briefly listen to a sermon, Victor, after Amicia's asking, will state that all the signs of the child's return are there, and to that end, he wants to show her something. What that something is lies behind a door and down a set of stairs, where Victor does this. Well, shit. Before we even have a chance to catch our breath, Victor immediately begins to slowly close in for the kill, while Amicia, now with a dislocated shoulder, can only manage to push herself along the floor of the temple we find ourselves in. While this happens, Victor will rather sinisterly explain his actions. Emily wants Hugo for herself, for she's convinced that he's the prophesied child of Embers. How she managed to come to this conclusion is never revealed. My best guess is that she saw how the rats arrived in the numbers that they have only a day after Amicia and Hugo did, and figured that it couldn't be mere coincidence. To take Hugo, Amicia must die, a necessity that appears strange at first. Why not just adopt them both, or, now that Beatrice is here, keep the whole family on the island? Fortunately, there is an answer for this. Unfortunately, it will be revealed through utterly tragic means later. Amicia will frantically tell Victor that they're all completely wrong about everything, to which the Count will concede that she's probably right, because he invented most of it. Wait, what? What the hell is he talking about? What does he mean, invented? Well, that's exactly what he means. He invented the whole Child of Ember story, but not out of some strange desire to run his own cult or to accrue more power. He's the Count of Provence, a title that, at that time, already held significant weight and importance. He did it... for Emily. As Victor tells it, Emily was abused by her parents, to the point where she tried to take her own life via poisoning. Somewhere in that mix, she became barren, unable to bear her own children. It's not clear whether her parents' abuse or her attempt to poison herself is what made her infertile, but I think we can all agree the sudden inability to have children wouldn't have done wonders on her already fragile mental state. For this reason, Victor took Emily to Lacuna and presented the Child of Ember story he created, which she took with both hands and subsequently turned it into the prosperous cult we see when we first arrived, which in turn allowed her to be the mother she always wanted to be, until her very own child, the Child of Embers, arrived. Unbeknownst to her, and everyone on the island however, is that it's all a lie, a ruse concocted by Victor. Well, I think we can all agree that he's a real piece of shit for taking advantage of Emily's fractured mental state, allow me to be devil's advocate for a moment and remind you that he's doing it for her, not for himself. It's pretty clear when we first see them together that they truly love one another. It's not for show, or put another way, it's not being forced for appearances. Amicia will even comment on how unexpected it is for most marriages between nobles at this time were arranged affairs, often used as part of negotiations between noble houses. Emily holds a considerable amount of sway with Victor, but it isn't without reason. As we'll learn later, or as can be inferred before then, Victor led a life of constant war before marrying Emily, who in turn showed him another way of living, one without violence and death. This alone holds a great amount of influence on him. In his eyes, for giving him the peace he never knew, Emily deserves everything, including the right to be a mother, hence the Child of Ember story, and why, as part of the peaceful living they sought, they essentially shacked up on Lacuna, while he left the rest of Provence in the hands of his lieutenants. Fast forward to the present, and now that their child has arrived in the form of Hugo, despite the rats threatening to ruin everything, Victor and Emily have a chance to finally fulfill all they had dreamed of. To that end, however, Amicia must die, completely unaware that doing so will only doom them to oblivion. Amicia crawls as far as an altar, which she uses to pull herself up, before grabbing a candelabra and striking Victor as he's about to land a killing blow. With Victor briefly dazed, Amicia takes her chance and flees, desperate to get back to Hugo. So begins an extended chase and stealth sequence. Intersecting the chase segments are areas where we have to directly avoid Victor by sneaking around the given environment. The last section before we make it back outside even requires we turn large cranks to open gates that allow us to escape. These cranks make lots of noise, however, and so it becomes a juggling act between turning the crank until Victor spots us, then running and hiding, drawing him away from our chosen crank, then sneaking back to continue turning it, rinsing and repeating until one of the gates are opened and we can continue our escape. Turning these cranks is a slow, laborious affair, however, given that Amicia is doing all this with a dislocated shoulder. This also renders us unable to strike back at Victor or even cause distractions. All we can do is run for our lives. All the while, Victor goes batshit crazy, his old habits from the past coming back as he hunts Amicia like common prey. Eventually we manage to escape him, before following a corridor that leads us back outside, 
where we find an old Roman theater. There, on the stage, we find Emily and Beatrice, the latter tied to a post, the former decked out in her ceremonial wear. Lucas is there as well, held by a soldier. Amicia attempts to intervene, but Victor shows up and looks to finally put an end to matters. Unwilling to give in, however, she manages to take Victor's sword, and the two have a duel, which is really just Victor toying with Amicia, taunting her as she vainly attempts to strike him down. Eventually, Victor overpowers her and prepares to end it all, but Beatrice's desperate pleas convince Emily to order Victor to stop, the Count instead cutting off her braid. Unfortunately, we're not done. Earlier, I wondered why they didn't just keep the Daroons on the island and live together as one big extended family. Well, it's because not only Amicia has to die, but Beatrice as well. To make Hugo hers, Emily must see old bonds of his old life severed. To that end, she takes a knife and presses it against Beatrice's throat. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> Amicia? Mummy? After a brief fade to black, we cut to Hugo, suddenly awake. He's in a bedroom somewhere in the palace, dressed in the colors of the Count and Countess. Confused and feeling strange, Hugo leaves the bedroom in search of Amicia and Beatrice in the only section in the entire game where we take control of Hugo. This is not like the section in Innocence where we control Hugo, not entirely. There's no need to sneak around and avoid guards in this portion. All we have to do is walk, following the path laid before us while Hugo calls out for the others. We eventually reach the same corridor that Amicia trod earlier, the one that took her outside to the theater. When Hugo steps outside, surprising everyone, we see Beatrice dead, her throat opened up. Emily attempts to play it off, but fails miserably, for Hugo is no fool. He sees exactly what happened, and as blackened veins appear on his face, the macula compels him to react accordingly. What? With rats bursting from underground, Victor is escorted to safety by his men, while Emily rejoices in that she was correct, Hugo is her child of embers. As rats form around him, Amicia, and a now free Lucas, Hugo conjures even more and sends them against Emily, who now pleads for him to stop. We regain control of Hugo, who, at Amicia's insistence, brings out more rats to play. Soldiers begin to appear and we sick the rats on them. It's a repeat of innocence when Nicholas sends soldiers against Hugo on Vitalis' order to get the macula to react. More and more soldiers appear, yet all fall to the rats, who burst from beneath and consume them, while Emily desperately tells him to stop, saying Amicia is deceiving him, but to no avail. Hugo wants blood. As this happens, take note of the slowly filling bar beneath the reticule. It's first introduced when you set off with Arnaud on the way to Sophia's hideout and fills every time you use Hugo's echo power, including as you control the rats. It monitors Hugo's stress levels, with the game warning not to overdo it, though as I've never filled it up, I can't say what happens if you do. Here in the theater, as you kill more and more soldiers, the bar fills up, eventually reaching critical levels as Hugo conjures more rats and grows more and more irate, Amicia urging him on while the macula in his blood goes haywire all the while. Once the bar fills up, the camera pans away and rats emerge from everywhere, killing any soldiers still lingering, the rest swirling around Hugo and the others. Our attention then focuses on Emily, who's in the midst of trying to escape, desperately reaching for Victor's outstretched hand. The game is up for the mother, and Hugo sets all the rats on her. The ground beneath her crumbles and she falls within, consumed by the vermin, while Victor can only look on in horror, while his men frantically keep him from jumping after her. He then turns his gaze on Amicia and promises vengeance, before storming off. The ground beneath the trio then crumbles and gives way, and they fall into whatever depths are below them while the screen cuts to black. When we come back, we find ourselves in some sub-level beneath the theater, Amicia holding Hugo, who's initially unresponsive, rendered unconscious initially by the stress. Much to Amicia's relief, he awakens, none the worse for wear physically. Mentally, though. As the next chapter begins, we see Hugo is not all there, becoming mentally disassociated, staring blankly off into nothing, unresponsive to Amicia's pleas for him to say something or even look at her. Wisely, Lucas tells her that they can't stay where they are, despite Amicia's desire to rest. Lucas takes the lead, helping Amicia up and coaxing a still disassociated Hugo to follow, and we follow him as we begin to traverse the ruins and search for a way out. He even resets Amicia's shoulder along the way, something that doesn't even engender an inkling of a reaction from Hugo. We eventually find an opening to the outside in a library of sorts, but it's too high. To reach it, we need to pull down a cart from an upper floor with a rope that's locked behind a door and some grating. Despite still being hurt, Amicia offers to do this, while Lucas attempts to bring Hugo back from whatever disassociated state he's in. During this section, you'll note that Amicia is not only suffering physically, but emotionally as well, for obvious reasons. 
She's just seen her mother murdered, and now her brother, the whole reason they came to Lacuna in the first place, has had his mind seemingly broken. While looking for a way to access the rope, we can find an offshooting study, hidden behind a rolling bookcase, destroyed just like everything else. In this room, you can interact with the desk, and it's here that Amicia succumbs to her grief, collapsing to the floor as she sobs, wondering aloud how she's going to rectify everything before gathering herself and pushing on. It's a deeply poignant moment, one that struck me on an emotional level I wasn't initially expecting, as Amicia allows her grief to come out, even if only briefly. It's a shame then that it can be easily missed, being tucked away in this hidden study, relegated to being the final souvenir you can find in the game, though calling it a souvenir feels very out of place. Eventually we reach the rope and use it to bring the card down, which proceeds to crash into a wall. Before we go to check it out, Amicia checks on Hugo, who remains as he was before, Lucas unable to snap him back to reality, saying that his mind is extinguished, surmising that it's not just the shock of earlier, but the macula itself. Checking out the cart, Amicia and Lucas attempt to pull it out, but it won't budge, which means that they won't be able to reach the ledge above. It's then that Lucas spies something through a gap between the cart and the wall, and suggests that they push the cart, to see what's behind. What they find, even just watching back the footage, still makes my skin crawl. An enormous nest, thousands if not millions of rats within, those sacks we saw at Basilius' prison scattered everywhere, their fumes able to snuff out fire. Before we have a chance to comprehend what we're seeing, Hugo says this. It will kill the sun. It's here that we're introduced to the nebula, the sun killer, the light devourer, but despite the very ominous names, we're not given much more than that, though I'd imagine the names alone are enough to convey a rough idea of what it is. Hugo will then say that he's home, but it's not really Hugo, but the macula speaking through him. Beatrice's death has left a vast emotional hole in Hugo, which the macula has exploited and used to take control of him. Amicia vows bloody vengeance against Victor, but Lucas quickly jumps in and snaps at her, telling her to focus. Hugo is drowning and needs Amicia, otherwise he'll end up like Basilius and be completely consumed by the macula. Despite her own emotional trauma, she has to keep him afloat and get him off this goddamn island. With no other way but forward, we begin to cross the nest. As we cross, take care not to get too close to the sacks. As mentioned earlier, the fumes will snuff out your torch if you aren't careful, along with being incredibly noxious. Lucas will state that the sacks and their fumes are the work of the nebula, that its light devourer sobriquet is quite literal. As we proceed, more sacks will explode, and Amicia will note that Hugo's body spasmed just before they did, suggesting that the macula, through Hugo, is controlling them and knows where they are, signs that the bond between him and the macula is only getting stronger. At the end of the nest, we pass through a narrow tunnel. At the end, we catch a glimpse of something massive, along with hearing faint beating sounds, like a heart. Except it's no heart, but a gigantic sack, like the smaller ones, and like the smaller ones, it's brimming with rats. Hugo will approach it and declare that he's home, and refuses to leave when Amicia attempts to pull him away. So here we are roughly three quarters of the way through the second video in this series, and we're only just now going to discuss the nature of the Prima Macula and how it's presented at length, now that I feel we've seen enough across both games of what it entails and what it can do, though there will be plenty more to be seen later. It would be easy to criticize Asobo and its writers for not doing a better job of doing something similar within the overarching narrative, but unlike the discussion around the macula's effect on emotions, I feel that would perhaps be a disingenuous or incorrect take, for as we'll discuss, the ambiguity surrounding the prima macula I feel is very intentional and for the best. When discussing the prima macula, one question often dominates the discussion. What is it? Is it an illness as previously believed, one that is somehow self-aware? Is it a malevolent spirit with malicious, albeit mysterious, motivations? Is it just simply a supernatural entity, born in ancient times, that can bestow on its host godlike powers? Hints and information gleaned across both games suggest that the truth is possibly somewhere in the middle of all three. That it's a supernatural entity with malicious intentions, intentions that it achieves by way of infecting the host like a disease, through which it bestows godlike powers before ultimately consuming the host to bring ruin to the world. But that's only if we view the macula through those three distinct and arguably most obvious possibilities, and that would be rather limiting, since the lack of concrete evidence as to just what it is lends to many more theories abounding about the subject. Some have theorized that it was an experiment gone wrong, possibly by the Order of Alchemists themselves, and that Basilius was its first victim, though I find this rather unlikely as it suggested in innocence that the Prima Macula has existed since the dawn of man, predating the Order. That would suggest that Basilius wasn't the first carrier, just the first known to history. Another theory suggests that the Prima Macula is a divine punishment, sent down by some deity as a curse on mankind for its wickedness, possibly in response to mankind's constant exercising of violence and slaughter, 
or in response to the unjust death of a particular individual, perhaps a messianic figure of sorts. Hint, hint. It can't be mere coincidence that the rats, the macula's chosen vectors of disease, seem to always appear where a great slaughter has taken place, or injustice of a violent kind has been committed. Consequently, such scenes often invoke feelings of extreme grief or rage, emotions that, as we discussed in the last chapter, the macula feeds on to gain more power. I could go on and on about many more theories, including one that suggests that the macula is an extraterrestrial virus that somehow made its way to Earth, but that would take too much time, and ultimately, it's all speculative. For in truth, all theories are possible, for the lack of answers regarding the true nature of the prima macula leaves the door wide open to all of them. It's almost endless. That alone is what makes the prima macula so fascinating and goddamn terrifying. It's gone from possibly being just a simple disease to a supernatural force that can bring whole civilizations to their knees, just as it did with Justinian's plague and now with the bite, condemning millions in the process, and yet there's still so much we don't know, while what we do know and have seen only further builds on the horrifying mystique it invokes. The reveal of the enormous subterranean rat sack, coupled with the macula having essentially taken Hugo's mind, is just another piece of that mystique, revealing more about it while simultaneously adding another layer to the debate around what it exactly is. Is the giant sack, in actuality, the macula's literal beating heart? If so, would that make the macula a living creature of sorts, one that's separate from it while it lives inside the carrier? Or is it just a creation of the macula, the epicenter of its rat-producing operations, while it waits for the carrier to succumb to its power? I think you're starting to get the idea. There's no telling what the true nature of the prima macula is, and that lack of concrete answers beyond the pure speculation we just discussed is again what makes it so fascinating, alongside said terror it invokes. In this regard, it shares quite a bit in common with the Reapers from the Mass Effect trilogy, more specifically Mass Effect 1 and 2. An unknowable, unfathomable force, one that renders entire civilizations ruined by just their will alone, yet we know so little about them beyond what's drip-fed to us, and even that is mostly subject to conjecture and speculation, which in turn makes them far more terrifying. Like Bioware did with the Reapers in Mass Effect 3 and the Leviathan DLC, I suspect we'll finally get some concrete answers if there is indeed a third game in the Plague Tale series. For now, I suggest we just enjoy the ambiguity of the Prima Macula for what it is. A wonderfully executed narrative device that does what I think was exactly intended, to keep us both intrigued and petrified in equal measure. Amicia tells a possessed Hugo that he ain't staying with the rat sack, before saying the same thing to the sack. The macula doesn't like this, and in response, the ground shakes and the tube things connecting the sack to the rest of the nest give way and rats burst from within, sending the trio fleeing through the tunnels as the vermin chase after them. We eventually make it back outside, taking shelter in the light of a burning tree and log. After taking a moment to catch their breath, Amicia will check on Hugo, who appears to still be under the macula's direct influence, though it appears to be subsiding, albeit slowly. While this is happening, the camera takes some time to focus on Lucas, who is no doubt just as devastated about Beatrice's death as Amicia and Hugo. She was his magistra, who took him on as her apprentice after the last magistra to sponsor him, Laurentius, died back in innocence. It's easy to forget that Lucas hasn't been free from suffering and torment either, but has kept a lid on his grief for the sake of Amicia and Hugo, to be their steady ship in the rat-infested shitstorm that has been their lives over the past year. Now that they have a moment, he can finally let his grief show, as he gazes up at the sky and fights back sobs, and I'm glad that the game took the time to show it. So despite all they've been through, they still have to reach the harbor. Following the path from the tunnels, we eventually catch sight of the village and notice something very strange. Much of the land has fallen away, bringing the sea closer and possibly taking some of the village with it. Hugo, now free of the Macula's influence, will blame himself for this, even after Lucas says it was the rats, and Amicia the Count and Countess. At the outskirts of the village, we see that the rat sacks, which Lucas takes to calling eggs, have been exposed by the Macula's tremors. Our path is also blocked by a massive swarm of vermin. To clear the way, Hugo, enraged by the voices in his head, commands the rats to throw themselves into the sea, clearing the way, a sign that his powers have only gotten stronger. We're now free to cross the village, but like before, we need to be wary of the rat eggs. Some soldiers will also appear, and if we're clever, we can use the eggs against the soldiers, if we so choose. From the soldiers, we hear Amisa be referred to as the Defiler, and that they're under orders to kill her and take Hugo. Reaching the village, we overhear that Arnaud is still due to be hanged at the harbor. Hugo wants to save him, in spite of his earlier actions, a request that Amisa reluctantly agrees to, since they have to go to the harbor anyways. There really isn't much to say about the village section. There are rats to avoid, and soldiers to deal with, or also avoid if you choose. That said, like seeing the villages in the palace before shit really hit the fan, it's rather striking and moving to see the village in such a state, given how it was when we first arrived hours earlier. 
We eventually reach the harbor, where Laraskas is still docked and Arnaud on the gallows, noose around his neck, surrounded by soldiers. We quickly kill the onlooking soldiers, but before we can free him, more begin to appear, and a frantic fight ensues, Lucas helping by throwing extinguish on soldiers with fire-bearing weapons. Things look clear, but just as Amicia is about to free Arnaud, even more soldiers appear, asking that Hugo come to them, that they're there to save him. Hugo, in response, simply conjures more rats to devour them, ending things before they started. Now we can free Arno. Battered and bruised, the knight is nevertheless grateful for the rescue, even if it's a silent show and not verbal, with Hugo giving him back his prized shield. From there we board Laraskas, with Sophia appearing to welcome us on board. She'll then ask after Beatrice, to which Hugo will answer that she isn't coming, before Amicia beckons that they set sail. Sophia concurs, taking Lucas with her to help, allowing the siblings to have a moment to themselves, which leads to one of the best written and performed scenes in the whole game. She's never coming back. I know. I wanted to tell her a lot of things. Me too. But she knew everything already. You are her greatest gift. She loved you the way you are, the way she made you. We will live. And we will heal. The scars? We keep them so that we don't forget. So that we can accept. Until they don't hurt anymore. The next chapter begins on Laraskas as we cross the Mediterranean, with the mainland in view, just as a new dawn breaks over the horizon. After Amicia and Lucas share a moment on the main deck, we're free to wander the ship at our leisure, just as we were able to on the way to Lacuna hours earlier. Now, saying we can wander is a bit of a misnomer, as there isn't anything new to see, just the chance to speak to those on board. Speaking with Hugo will progress the story, though I'd recommend you check in with Lucas and Sophia before you do. After speaking with him, we can take Hugo to check on Arnaud, who's dozed off nearer towards the bow. We wake up Arno, who gives thanks to Hugo for convincing Amicia to rescue him. Amicia, still throwing jabs, will tell Arno he should try resting for a bit, for the war's over. And it's just after she says that, that Sophia spots a ship, flying the colors of Provence, following them, and coming in fast. The Count clearly isn't ready to give up on taking Hugo, and things go from 0 to 100 in a snap. While Lucas takes Hugo into the cabin to hide, Amicia and Arno assist Sophia in helping them go faster, starting with raising the mainsail, then turning it to the wind. This doesn't work, however, the Count's ship still closing in. In one last attempt to gain some speed, Amicia and Arnaud look to throw some of the cargo overboard, but the Count's ship draws close enough to start firing flaming arrows onto the deck, forcing Amicia to leave Arnaud so she can fight back on the stern. This fight doesn't last long, despite her efforts in killing numerous archers. As soon as the Count's ship rams Laraskas, the screen goes black. We hear Lucas screaming, Sophia shouting, followed by a splash of water, and Arnaud calling out to Amicia while exclaiming that they, Lucas and Sophia, have fallen overboard in one of the more strangely choreographed transitions I've seen in a video game. It's meant to represent Amicia getting briefly knocked unconscious by the top of mainsail, which we see when she reawakens and gets up, but since we don't see her getting knocked out, just Laraskas getting rammed, the screen shaking violently, then cutting to black, it just feels very strange, like there's a piece of the scene missing. Amicia will frantically search the ocean for Lucas and Sophia, before spotting Arnaud challenging Victor's men. Amicia quickly joins him in defending what's left of the ship, while a frightened Hugo continues to hide in the cabin. This section can be pretty tricky. Arnaud is a more than capable fighter, but will be overwhelmed if confronted by two or more soldiers, thus Amicia must support him however she can, while also taking out javelin throwers and archers trying to kill her. Thankfully, there is an abundance of crossbow bolts available, and if you have the crossbow fully upgraded, as well as an abundance of bolts from before, then this fight just becomes a matter of having a quick trigger finger while remaining in cover. After a while, Hugo will emerge from the cabin and beg for Amicia to come inside. She attempts to reach him, but, in the process, takes an arrow through her side. As Hugo panics, Arnaud falls to her side, shielding her, beckoning Hugo to come to them. It's then that Victor comes on board. 
Seeing him, Hugo attempts to conjure rats to kill him, but this obviously doesn't work because they're on water, not land. Goaded by him, Hugo then charges Victor, who promptly knocks him unconscious. What follows is the full unhinging of Victor as Arno attempts to reason with him. Like many things, it's a striking contrast from when we first met him. Despite his possible complicity with what happened in the Red City, as we discussed back in Chapter 3, Victor struck me as a somewhat decent man at first, even if that decency was but a mask for his sordid past, maintained by his unwavering love for Emily. Now that Emily is gone, however, the mask has come off. He's reverted to being his old self. As he explains to Arnaud, he's a man whose only purpose is to fan the flames of war and violence in the world. To that end, he intends to use Hugo and his powers and set the world on fire, then forge an empire from what's left. It also seems that he's begun to fervently believe the very lie he concocted back on Lacuna regarding the Child of Embers. He refers to Hugo as Emily's and his son, one that is a god and not in the euphemistic sense. This is a far cry from the man who merely created the original story to give his wife the life she deserved and even acknowledge that he was wrong about most of it. To me, it's eerily similar to what happened to Hugo in a way, following the theater scene. Just as the macula took a hold of Hugo's mind to fill the void left by his mother's death, it appears as if the Child of Embers has taken root in Victor's mind to fill the void left by Emily's death, turning him into a true believer, not just someone who's playing along. It's almost ironic in a way. The lie he created turned out to be partly true, but the part he got wrong, the most crucial part, ultimately led to the death of his wife and the destruction of his carefully cultivated island paradise and turned him into the monster he tried so hard not to be through his love of Emily. I would almost say that it's tragically ironic, but that would suggest that he's worthy of sympathy, which he most certainly isn't. He manipulated his mentally ill wife with a lie that gave her false hope, one that ultimately got her killed in the end. Her death and countless others are on his head. It could be why he's become unhinged. The guilt of Emily's death, as well as the absence of the stability she gave him, has broken his teetering mind, where he now believes the Child of Ember's story to the fullest and intends to use Hugo and his powers to forge his new empire. Victor turns to leave, with Hugo in his clutches, before ordering Arnaud and Amicia be finished off. With little option, Arnaud picks up Amicia and throws her overboard, before jumping after her, bringing the current chapter to a close. When we return, we find Amicia on the shore, alive but a little worse for wear, being tended to by Arnaud while the wreck of Laras cast lies further along. Once Arnaud helps Amicia up, we begin to follow the coast, to find Lucas and Sophia, who have also survived and have gone on ahead to search for supplies and horses to get to Marseille, which we can see in the distance. I do have a bit of a nitpick here, and it's that I can't help but wonder how both Amicia and Arnaud managed to survive. Though the mainland was in sight, they were still pretty far out from shore, and they were laden with heavy equipment that would weigh them down, making swimming all the more difficult, regardless of the distance. I can believe that Arnaud managed to get a hold of Amicia and pull her with him, but the problem still remains. It's a far swim, and they're pretty heavily laden with their equipment. I know it's a strange thing to critique, but it's something that's always bothered me when I get to this part. Through a small crevice, we catch sight of Laraskas, ruined beyond repair, never to sail again. It's also here that we run into Victor. Right from the off, he starts spouting off, declaring that he'll bring Amicia's head to Hugo to sever the last link he has to her, which we all know by now to be the worst fucking idea imaginable. Arno challenges Victor to make sure Amicia lives to get Hugo, and also, in case you've forgotten, and I wouldn't blame you, because he's still got a score to settle with Victor, telling Amicia to cover him. It's during this fight that we finally learn the origins of their beef. Victor, in Aquitaine, presumably fighting the English, abandoned Arno and his men to the enemy, and in the process, Arno's son was killed. Ever since, Arno sworn vengeance. However, you'll only get this information if you're paying attention and listening, which you might not be doing considering what this fight entails on Amicia's end. It's kind of annoying that this information is relegated this way since it's because of this beef that Amicia and Hugo end up in the company of Victor and Emily, and I have to wonder what would happen if Arno hadn't acted like he did in the courtyard. That being said, in the essence of fairness, at least we got some form of an explanation to the why and how, unlike other particular questions that have come up and are never answered. As Arno fights Victor, our job is to simply handle all of the Count's men, who will either attempt to come in close or attack from range from the cliffs surrounding the beach and the wreck. It's akin in certain respects to the fight on the boat, except this time we have many more options to combat the soldiers and you don't have to worry about Arno, who's solely focused on Victor. All the while, Amicia and Arno will demand to know where Hugo is, but Victor, as expected, isn't telling. Then, about midway through the fight, this happens. Hugo. Victor, the goddamn idiot, has taken Hugo to Marseille. 
Now, in a direct repeat of what happened to Basilius, Hugo, believing that Amicia is dead, has fully given himself over to the macula and entered the last threshold. Victor's stupidity and broken mind has doomed them all. A great cloud of dust and god knows what else emanating from Marseille blankets the sky and the battleground, greatly limiting visibility. It's in these conditions that we finish the rest of the soldiers, while Arnaud and Victor continue duking it out, the Count unwilling to accept, in his insanity, that he caused all of this to happen. After some time, we cut to Victor getting the better of Arnaud, stabbing him through the stomach. Not about to give in, however, Arnaud manages to pull off Victor's helmet, giving Amicia the chance to finish it. With the Count finally dead, Amicia rushes to Arno's side, but it's too late, the Grizzled Knight having accepted his fate, saying that it's time. We then go and free Lucas and Sophia, who were tied up to a nearby wagon the whole time. While Sophia and Amicia mourn Arno, Lucas will gaze up at the sky and note the clouds of dust and falling embers to be the work of the Macula, or more specifically, that of the Nebula. With the clouds spreading everywhere, blotting out the sun, the rats will be able to spread unchecked. This is his judgment. The trio need to get to Marseille, and fast. To that end, they commandeer the wagon and make for the city. As we approach the city, we start to see streams of people fleeing the nebula, while simultaneously beginning to feel and hear tremors, a sign that Hugo may still be alive, though probably not a good sign. As we get closer, things become progressively more frantic, people screaming, trying to escape whichever way they can, while the tremors get stronger and more frequent, what Lucas calls the final chant of the macula. We eventually make it to the main gate, but find it wisely sealed. Strangely, it's been sealed from the outside, the people trying to keep something from getting out, the tremors being caused by that something beating against the walls. The trio need to find another way through. Sophia mentions another gate further along the wall, but the way is blocked by some hay. The wagon, however, is armed with the same cannon we saw back at the palace, the one that can spit Greek fire. Using that, we clear the hay and start to follow the wall. As we begin, the tremors beating against the walls begin to get stronger. Suddenly, they finally destroy a section of the walls and millions of rats pour out and begin chasing them. Using the Greek fire, we desperately keep the rats at bay, though only just, as Sophia pushes the horses to their limit. More rats emerge from behind the city walls, taking the walls with them or just spilling over, such are their numbers. We get a slight reprieve after we pass under an aqueduct, but this doesn't last long as another section of wall is breached and the rats continue the chase. This time, they take the whole wall with them, and the chase soon ends when a tower collapses on us. After a cut to black, we return to find the trio, battered but somehow alive. They proceed to enter Marseille, knowing that Hugo is somewhere at the heart of all this destruction, the rats, now under his control, sweeping through the city like an army. Passing through a door, we finally catch a glimpse of what's become of Hugo. A large spherical growth in the heart of Marseille, shrouded in dust and mist, sending forth millions if not billions of rats in a wide sweeping arc, first across the city, then the rest of Europe, and probably beyond. The nebula, with its mushroom shape, how it flattened huge swathes of Marseille, and the way it disseminates both the clouds, dust, and rats, is often viewed as an allegory of atomic weapons, or, more broadly, weapons of mass destruction and their power. Like such weapons, the powerful want Hugo for his powers, to use him as a weapon, or, at the very least, a means to threaten their enemies, just like many of today's nuclear superpowers do with their own saber-rattling, even if it means risking the destruction of the entire world. Unfortunately, in the Plague Tales series, the disastrous mishandling of Hugo's power by these powerful individuals has only brought the proverbial doomsday clock closer to midnight, with Victor being the one to finally push the minute hand over the line. Again, not unlike today's superpowers are doing with the real doomsday clock. Now, as the trio cast their gaze out towards the nebula, we see the end result, a precursor of what's to come if Hugo isn't stopped. It brings to mind the famous quote by J. Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb, where he quotes the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Hugo, by giving in to the last threshold, has become one with the macula, which means, as you might have already guessed, he's somewhere in that twisted mess, which means we have to get down there and try to reach him. Amicia offers to go alone, but Lucas states plainly that they're all going, the three of them together being what connects Hugo to the real world. Things get off to a rough start, however, when the rats collapse the building they're in. Sophia gets injured to the point where she can't continue, staying where she is while Amicia and Lucas press on. 
things go from bad to worse, as if they weren't already, by the fact that we need to cross open ground to get to the nebula. That means braving the waves of oncoming rats, rushing for different spots to cover, waiting for the rats to pass, then sprinting for the next piece of cover, while also taking care to watch for the huge chunks of the ground collapsing beneath them. We eventually catch sight of a footbridge and make one last dash for it, while the ground around us begins to give way. Miraculously we make it, and the duo take a moment to catch their breath, though they know their ordeal is far from over. The footbridge has collapsed further on, the slope it's created descending into the great clouds emanating from the nebula itself. Lucas describes the nebula as a sort of crucible, where Hugo, the macula, and the nebula are all merging into one. Hugo's visions, that of a deceived child, are quite literally dissolving into the atmosphere, changing the world, hence the great clouds and swathes of dust blotting out the sun. Down there, all natural laws stop. With no other option to reach Hugo, they descend into this crucible, with no telling what they'll find down there. We jump forward to the base of the slope, where we find Amicia, alone and without a crossbow, Lucas nowhere to be found. Down here, the air is choked with the same black shit the rat's nests give off, choking the air and making it hard to breathe. Nevertheless, we forge on ahead, following the path laid for us. We eventually find the remains of some square, where the clouds turn a strange burnt yellowy-orange color. In the square is a rather odd sight. A phoenix statue, just like the ones we found in Lacuna, the ones that led us to the map. Thinking along similar lines, we continue in the direction the statue is facing, soon finding another, and another, and another. After some time we hear Hugo's voice, who tells us that we're doing it wrong, that Amicia is still looking back. You might start to realize at this point that the statues have been leading us in a circle. Hugo is close, but to reach him we have to start thinking outside the box. To do that, at a statue we need to start heading in the opposite direction that it's facing. Once we've gone far enough, we're transported to some sort of twisted temple, skeletal statues staring back at us. Rats will then pour out from the statues and start forming freakish rat men, who we can kill using Ignifer. This, however, is also a trick. There are too many for Misi to handle and she's inevitably overwhelmed, sending her back to the Phoenix statues and we start the process all over again. <sighs> what? What happened? The trick is not to fight back. It's another lesson from Hugo, teaching Amicia that she doesn't always have to fight, despite what her instincts tell her. To this end, we need to put out the brazier, at which point Amicia will collapse, tired of fighting, just wishing to see Hugo again. We're then transported again, and this time we finally see Hugo, whom Amicia embraces as she begins to sob. With Hugo holding her hand, we follow a corridor, then a gorge, while Hugo explains what he did, that he thought Amicia was dead, that he was alone, and from that he made a grave mistake just like Basilius did with Aelia. We soon start having visions of past moments in the story, starting with the Pilgrim's Camp, then the Red City Market, followed by the Festival Grounds on Lacuna. At each location, blackened veins, representing the macula, kill all the people and infect the Earth, a visceral representation of what will happen if Hugo isn't stopped. Amicia will ask how she can stop it from happening, to which Hugo will answer that she already knows, and perhaps what we already know. Hugo must die. Amicia understandably doesn't want to do this, but Hugo states it's the only way to save the world, now that he can no longer be saved. Stepping through another door, we find Hugo has disappeared, telling Amicia that she's ready, with the nebula glowing in the distance. As we begin to approach, Amicia and Hugo will give their goodbyes, and you can almost feel Amicia's heart breaking as she sobs, her worst fear of losing Hugo and being alone painfully coming true. She'll then collapse, exhausted and perhaps unwilling to continue. It's then that Lucas reappears, carrying her crossbow. After he embraces her for a moment, he helps her to her feet, and we finally see the nebula, with Hugo at its heart. So begins our final approach. It's an incredibly emotional moment, and like Amicia, your mind will no doubt be racing. Over the course of two games, we've seen Amicia go from being a sweet, innocent girl living peacefully on her family estate, to a young woman capable of killing, often mercilessly, while being subjected to all kinds of horror and suffering while wading through mud, blood, and disease. She did all of this for Hugo, a little boy who, through no fault of his own, has been made to endure his own significant suffering, all because of a power that he didn't ask for, a power that others tortured him and those he loves for, a power that was slowly killing him and has now consumed him through cruel manipulation of his very soul. Together they've survived, they've suffered, and they've endured a world that has only subjected them to pain and misery, and has taken from them almost all they hold dear, and now threatens to take the last of whatever hope they have for the future, with a simple question being asked, is this a world worth saving? 
And yet, it's through this little boy, who the world has only sought to inflict untold horrors upon, that we see that the world is worth saving. Despite being beset by wickedness and cruelty, rife with violence and suffering, there is still so much good to be found, particularly in the people we've met along this journey. Some, sadly, are no longer with us, but from their memory is born the hope of a better future, and for that alone, the world is worth saving. To that end, the little boy must make the ultimate sacrifice, one he's willing and prepared to make, if it means that this broken world will heal, a sacrifice that can only come to pass by the hand of his big sister. The same big sister who sacrificed mind, body, and soul to keep him safe, to give him the future he deserved. The same big sister who now readies her sling to kill him. But we're not done yet. After a short credit roll, where we see the clouds and dust from the nebula clear from the skies and around Marseille, we cut to a house in the mountains, in June 1350. One year has passed since the events of Marseille, and in that time, Amici has taken up residence at the family house in the mountains, the same one mentioned by Beatrice back at the palace. As she exits the house, she carries with her a set of saddlebags, indicating she intends to leave. After taking a moment to sit on a stump, we hear a familiar voice feels higher each time. <laughs> oh, Sophia. Sophia has arrived, coming to pick her up. As we head to where Sophia has left their horses, we learn she intends to track the macula, knowing it didn't die with Hugo, just disappeared, no doubt looking for a new host. To that end, she wishes to find the new carrier and, by extension, the new protector, so that she may guide them, so that they don't make the same mistakes as she did, and they go down a far gentler path. Sophia, for her part, intends to get her where she needs to go, having gotten a new ship, and will also learn that she's given up smuggling, preferring the security and calmness of more legal trading. It's also during this conversation that Sophia will ask after the whereabouts of Lucas, whose conspicuous absence you may have already noticed, and Amicia's answer may differ here, for there are in fact two possible endings. When you reach Hugo at the Nebula, you can choose to have Amicia stand there and do nothing, even as Lucas urges her to do what must be done. Wait long enough and a cutscene will play, where Amicia falls to her knees and tearfully proclaims she can't do it. Lucas will then take it upon himself and, using Amicia's crossbow, will do the deed himself. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If Amicia does it, all she'll say is that he won't be coming, for he's still on the road studying. If Lucas does it, when Sophia asks, Amicia will sharply answer that he won't be. Again, because he's on the road studying, but also because Amicia can still see him do it. Some have posited that, with this ending, Amicia now hates Lucas, but I can't help but be doubtful of this. It's certainly plausible, and the inflection in Amicia's voice would suggest that there is some amount of anger, but I reckon it's more that Lucas's presence would conjure memories that Amicia would much rather be left in the past. You will also take note of Amicia's hair, which has now been greatly cut short, a far cry from the extravagant braid she was sporting at the very beginning of the story. Attention will be first drawn to her hair when we run into a woman at the Red City Market, offering to change her style, before referring to a woman's hair as her crown. Over the course of the narrative, there will be moments where Amicia's hairstyle gradually changes. It starts with her sides being shaved after Arnaud patches her head injury, followed by Victor cutting off her braid, forcing her to sport a weird little ponytail, then ending with her cutting it all off at some point during the intervening year. This gradual change can be interpreted many different ways, though I think the base interpretation is meant to highlight the dramatic changes in her life, with her latest style meant to symbolize renewal, or the beginnings of a fresh start. Reaching the horses, everything looks to be set, before Amicia, casting her gaze down a nearby path, asks Sophia if she can take some time to do one last thing. We then set off down the path, which first continues through the forest, then along a mountainside, where we get a rather impressive vista. Passing through a narrow crevice, we find our ultimate quarry. Three standing stones, and at the center of them, a small stone cairn. A memorial to Hugo. What follows is one of the most beautifully composed and incredibly moving scenes I have ever seen in a video game, or any work of fiction for that matter, one that has brought me very near to tears on every playthrough I've done. Words alone cannot do justice to this scene. With that said, instead of the usual outro I do for my videos, I'm going to let this scene stand on its own, as it should, and end this video with this. A Plague Tale Requiem is a triumph of video game storytelling. Despite certain contrivances and stretches of logic, leaving numerous questions unanswered and a slight crack in the continuity, it's a story well worthy of all the praise it has received, and one that will stay with me for years to come.
Hey. They didn't used to come here before. You'd be good at making friends. I wasn't sure I was ready, but Sophia's here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Why is it so hard? <laughs> we never backed down, right? We held. May this earth remember how much you loved it. May it remember all you gave to protect it. I remember. forgotten. Thank <laughs> you. 